if my daughter was overweight, that would be tough. I want her to be happy with whoever she is, but the whole thing that I want her to be happy in the face of something that's literally not healthy, like it's not, like for a variety of reasons. And that's unequivocal. You cannot say because you're overweight that you're as healthy as somebody that is not. Now you can be skinny and just as unhealthy as that overweight person, which is the other side of the spectrum, right? That we need to realize that it's not about body morphology. It's about what's happening physiologically within that body that's actually more important. Dr. Bo Beard, thank you for joining me. Man, thanks for having me. So I wanted to, to get into your book, The Age of Movement. And I actually I came across The Age of Movement from doing a deep dive on your YouTube channel. And I was having some low back pain. Your entire DNS playlist, which we'll get into, those exercises came up and then eventually led me to The Age of Movement. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, in your book, you begin with a story about a freak fracture of your femur at nine years old. And I wanted to ask you if you could give a, a brief overview of that story you tell in the book and, and what happened that day, what happened that day and how it changed the way you thought about movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so that's, you know, why I'm doing what I do today. But the short of a long, as short as I can make it is uh, a good friend of mine, still a friend of mine. Uh, we were playing pickup football and kind of jumped on my back to tackle me, I had a spiral fracture in my femur, um, kind of an odd fracture because it doesn't seem like it should have happened. Uh, but I'm from a very small town in central Illinois, Canton, Illinois, shout out. It's like 10,000 people. So when I go to my local hospital, they don't know what to do. They're like, we, you know, do we cast this? So they basically put me in traction for two or three days. My, I mean, this is, it sounds crazy, but a couple decades ago, which makes me feel really old. Um, put yeah. me in traction. They call a surgeon from Peoria, Illinois, which is, a uh, you know, Metro of like 300,000. He comes over and he's like, mm. you got two options. We'll put you in a cast that covers almost both your legs and your pelvis, or you can get this like kind of newer, uh, surgery where we put a titanium rod in the middle mm. of your bone. And I was like, not knowing anything. I was like, well, what's the difference? Well, one, you're going to be in a cast for multiple months. The other one, you're going to be on crutches for a few months and then it'll be good. And I was like, well, give me that titanium rod. Um, the surgery was fine. I, maybe the better option, you know, out of the two, I, nobody will ever know. What wasn't the great option though, was that I received absolutely zero physical therapy. Um, so before I left the hospital, they just wanted to see if I could walk up and down stairs. So it wasn't even PT. It was just like, can you get up and down stairs without falling on your crutches? And then they said, see you later. Um, after a two and a half week stay in the hospital, uh, so, you know, I went back for follow-ups, but it wasn't until, you know, five years later where I was playing football again and we were watching some film and I had a fantastic coach that didn't pull punches. And he's like, why the hell are you limping when you're running? And I had no clue. And that was the <laughs> first like epiphany to me of like, well, wait a minute, is something going on? And then, you know, I uh, had a run in with a chiropractor due to another injury. And then she kind of yeah. looked at all of this stuff and was like, what is going on? And that's basically was the catalyst for you know, having my first look into my profession, uh, maybe how things could have went differently for me. And then that's why I do what I do now, because I want to make sure that whoever enters my clinic, kid, adult, you know, um, whatever the injury is that they're able to have every opportunity for proper rehab versus not even knowing that that is an option in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to the the spiral fracture because you you said it's a, a freak injury in the book, a, a sort of a freak fracture. Is a spiral fracture exactly what it sounds like? Does your bone actually f fracture in some sort of spiral formation, like it's twisted up? Yep. So if you can imagine, you know, your femur, the longest bone in your body, just imagine if you had a stick. And the way that my injury happened, so the ground was kind of frozen and somebody pulled me down from behind and my leg went out to the side mm -hmm. of me at a 90 degree and it literally put torque on my femur. Well, yeah, it sends a spiral crack around that femur. The reason it's, and mine had some splintering or some fragments that kind of uh, blew off the bone. The reason it's hard is because it's not this linear fracture, right? You think breaking your bone, it just breaks across. Mm -hmm. So then you're like, well, you can't, it's either like eight screws in the middle of your leg or this one giant rod going down the middle of your femur, um, or a cast for a really long time. Uh, yeah. So it was freak. So it's how much, how much do you think your ability to get through that 
comes down to your the age you're at like if you if you experience a similar injury now do you think that you'd make the same decision do you, do you think you'd still go for the rod would you go for the surgery so there I, i'll dive into this a little bit because i know that we'll talk about general health yeah. stuff so here i'll i'll spin back around to your uh question but mm. we have a a patient slash friend here that's a runner and two or three years ago she was running a road marathon and in the middle of the road marathon had a freak fracture of her femur that was a, a complex fracture, what we used to call a compound fracture, where her femur came out of her leg just on a step, mm. right? Hit the ground. Well, she had a rod put in her femur much like I did, All right. So that is actually, it's kind of the gold standard now, right? Like we just know that mm. your femur, if you fracture it, like you're going to have to have something to help that thing along. The, yeah. the health aspect where I say, would I make the same decision? I don't know because now there's a lot of research. I've had this, you know, the hardware in here for almost 30 years now. Um, there's a lot of research coming out on titanium oxidation and uh, basically TiO1 and TiO2 particles and how they're hepatotoxic. So there's things that, again, you would never know at the time, but now it could be a major detriment to my health, especially in the you know next two decades. And now I don't have the option to go backwards. So that's another big part of my practice yeah. now is making sure that everybody is fully informed, um, aware of everything, but in the face of future things not being perfect, sometimes the right decision still comes down to that, right? That you know, like this isn't the best thing for 20 years, right? But right now yeah. it's the absolute best thing for you. And that's not an easy decision to make. Yeah, I I wanted to get into this later in the podcast but it, it's a, it seems like a good spot to get into now so so you mentioned that when you had the titanium rod put in you weren't given much in the way of corrective exercises or, or exercises to improve the the patterns that may have led to that injury mm -hmm. is that is that correct and and I'm, I come from a college baseball background I've been playing baseball since I was five years old, all the way up till 22, 23 years old. I'm 28 now. Uh, I feel really fucking old saying that like 20 <laughs> years ago. It's, it's 2000. I got, like I, I started playing baseball. You, so. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I've, I started playing baseball around the year 2000, which seems like it was yesterday. And that's, uh, that's wild. But I've, I've experienced injuries and so many of my friends and teammates have experienced injuries where they undergo a surgery or they undergo some sort of treatment, but the underlying pattern that led to that injury, whether it's a rotator cuff tear, you see that a lot in baseball or UCL tear, there's no really analysis of the forces that led to that injury in particular. And how is your body moving? How is your elbow moving? Do you have enough flexibility and mobility in your hips to be able to generate that force without injury because there, there are a lot of guys that can throw very very hard but their bodies may not be set up the best way to perform that action thousands of times over the course of four or five years you know mm -hmm. every single day or, or once a week if you're starting pitcher and i i don't know whose fault it is or who has responsibility because the the surgeon's job is just you know they're performing the surgery the physical therapist gives me exercises that they've studied and that they know will strengthen my tissue but there seems like there's this missing element of correcting the pathways and correcting the movements that led to the injury to start with well you're uh a awesome point to or two points were in there actually right the fact that like are we actually looking at these things and whose responsibility is it? So let me tackle the second one first because I think it's easier. Uh, the responsibility piece, yeah. I think nowadays, it has to come down to you as the patient. There's so much information. We are over-specialized in medicine and healthcare, so you're going to people that are extremely specialized. So you can't Im imagine that they're going to have the bandwidth to explore all of the health ramifications outside of just their specialty. So then you kind of have to go in with like, mm. you know, hey, I'm talking to you know, my primary care physician, my internist, other people that have had the surgery, friends that are in the same field and like coming in with that info, which some doctors bristle against, Hey, listen to me. I'm the physician. I'm the, you know, the chief here. Yeah. Like, well, no, not really. There's a lot of information out there nowadays where there didn't used to be right. When, even if I would have been an adult 
in 93 or uh, whenever I fractured my leg, the information at hand for that decision making, you know, wasn't there. Now, the first part of your question or point of, you know, are we appropriately addressing these things or how do we, I mean, that's literally the question that keeps me up at night or we're sitting around drinking wine with people in my, you know, profession. Like, yeah, that's the unending question because let's take my scenario. Like there was trauma, right? Somebody jumped on my back. I'm a kid and I have a fracture. I've thought this through a thousand times. Like, did I have some bony resorption issue, low vitamin D, allow my femur to fracture? Did I have crappy hip movement, you know, and internal rotation sucked and I snapped my femur? Or is it just a freak injury? Well, let's say it's just mm. a freak injury. Are there patterns to address that were present before? Granted, there still should have been physical therapy for can you get adequate strength, range of motion, all that stuff that didn't happen anyways, which blows my mind. But like, let's say that woman running the marathon fractures her femur with no real trauma. She's just running. Mm. Now she could still have a bony, you know, malabsorption issue, osteoporosis, penia, something, you know, even something crazier. But what if it is a movement thing or repetitive stress injury? I mean, that's what we think we're doing. I tell people all the time, my clinic and our team here, we, I don't want to do post-op rehab. I think it's extremely boring. No, no knock to anybody mm -hmm. that that's their passion, but like to do, you know, three times a week, sets and reps, I see like get stuff moving. Cool. We want to see you after that or before that to clean up that stuff or prehab it or rehab it on the back end to say like, well, what got us here in the first place? What was the strategy at play that upended your performance and led to injury? And that's, yeah. if I didn't have that perspective, I think I would, I would get really bored just like the post-op PT because I wouldn't be problem solving. I would just be doing. Yeah. Th there are a lot of people in baseball, especially who are very quick to get surgery on things like the UCL because there's this perceived repetitive, uh, repetitive success that th there are a lot of repeat uh success in ucl surgeries and guys do come back throwing harder whether that's the surgery or the rehab that went into post-surgery and, yep. and people are able to perform healthier again and you know i myself while i was playing i also didn't really take into account all the factors that come into surgery that people don't consider like the the the, the tissue uh scarring and losing all your mobility uh going out uh, putting on a button down shirt and realizing one arm is half the size of the other because it got <laughs> cut into it. <laughs> and you're like, well, uh, this is, I guess this is atrophy. Um, and it sucks, but, and, and eventually, uh, if you put in the work and you're lucky and you have a good program, most people can get back to the point where they're as good or better than before the surgery, depending on what age you get the surgery. Mm -hmm. But it's, it, it does seem like people, uh, and I can only speak for the baseball world, really. They don't really think about all the things that are involved in something like cutting your elbow open and getting another UCL or even a small procedure like scraping out a rotator cuff or something like that. Well, we, you know, there's two, I'll throw two kind of points in there. The incidence of or increased likelihood of uh, degenerative arthritic change in a knee just from a scope exploratory scope, just putting a arthroscope in there and looking around goes up almost twofold. So like you said, wow. surgery is planned trauma, right? You're literally going to cut somebody up. You're just planning it. And what your point with UCL, it became a wild west show a couple years ago of planned UCL surgeries for performance outcomes. They were doing these on teenagers that yeah, they didn't yeah. have a torn UCL. They were going to go in and operate on it, which this is great. They were going to basically like micro tear it, right? They were going and lacerate it, try to get it to scar up because people had been told like post operative UCLs do better. Well, what was the, it's kind of like that. Uh, you're just not actually seeing the correct information of why something's happening. It's usually mm -hmm. the rehab. It's just like most people that have a shoulder operation, mm -hmm. like this shoulder that I had operated on is way better than the other one. Well, you actually did it like three months of work on it. If you worked on your other shoulder for three months, it'd probably be really good too. Um, but people just think, well, I had the surgery. That was the change because you know, it's, it's, it's a giant placebo effect, right? Another study looked at, mm. uh, ACL repair and they went in and basically had sham surgery versus actual ACL repair where both people under just uh, local anesthesia watched a screen 
of a surgery occurring. Some people were getting it done. Some people weren't. Both people got their knees scoped. The people that did not have the ACL mm. reconstruction had better long-term outcomes than the people that actually had it reconstructed, which seems crazy. Really? So, so, so the like, people that just had their knee cut open and were watching another surgery, it, what, it wasn't happening to their bodies. Those people had better outcomes than the people who actually had the surgery. Yeah, which seems impossible. You're like, well, how's that work? That does. If somebody, asked, <laughs> but it, but the human body, we just don't, you know, we don't give it enough uh, credit of like we're. I've never fixed anybody, right? I've just allowed things to mm. become a little more efficient, offload structures, and then what happens? <laughs> the physiologic forces at play can mm. do things like they're supposed to, um, and then here we go, right? That's what's actually working. I'm not healing anybody fixing anybody like i was just talking to a surgeon here in town that's done a ton of shoulder surgeries on pro baseball players and we were talking about mm. how fast people can get back nowadays and he goes no faster than they can heal and we still haven't figured out how to speed up healing so i don't know why we think we can get people back two months faster than we used to yeah you can't like you literally can't like mm. it's the tissue right yeah that that study that study is wild i i you know just hearing people seeing that that mental aspect of injuries you know i i have nothing i obviously i wasn't part of that study so i've i've nothing to compare it to from a, a surgery standpoint but there there have been instances where i had the opportunity to get an mri on my shoulder or my hip where i knew i was having some pain and towards the end of my baseball career i actually started refusing mris because something would always come up sure. um and yeah. probably you know it wasn't the smartest <laughs> but th there are some instances where i probably shouldn't should have just gotten the mri that i don't think it's a smart thing to do a lot of times like if you feel a problem you should definitely get an mri if it's it's persisting but there, there were instances where i know my shoulder has been being broken down over the course of 15 years mm -hmm. if i get an mri something is going to show up and that tear or strain whatever it is may not be the source of my pain but then i exactly. see the tear the physician shows it to me and now i'm identifying as someone who has a tear in their rotator cuff even though it might be an imbalance or something that was causing the pain but now i'm just like being extra careful with my shoulder and changing all these things that are going on. So in some cases, yeah. you know, it, it seems like it could be a good idea to address the pain as much as possible pre MRI or pre visual, but before the athlete is shown, you know, this is who you are. You are someone with a torn labrum, torn, whatever, uh, try to address it first. When that gets into, I mean, we we're talking about the placebo, which we tend to call yeah. belief effect. That's nocebic effect, right? Even though it's not planned nocebo, nocebo means a negative effect due to something that's not basically specific treatment, mm. right? It's outside of the treatment that's planned. But that, I mean, again, to I don't want to be just a t statistics, you know, uh, teller here, but like, if you put this is data driven, if you put a hundred people in a room. You do a lumbar MRI, 50% of those people on average are going to have something show up, disc herniation. You split yeah. those people in half again, only half are going to have pain. So then just like wow. you said, so if I show somebody an image with disc degeneration, a lumbar disc herniation, and then they buy into that, they've just created what we call a neuro tag. Their brain now believes that their pain is generated by that. And then if a physician explains it that way, they add their basically place of authority to that you get a massive nocebic effect. I mean, that is, you mm -hmm. can't completely stray away from that. There, we're lucky we have advanced imaging, right? It, it's awesome yeah. when it's needed, but then it comes down to, you know, here's another statistic. So the cost of uh, low back treatment. So let's say you go in for low back pain. If we do the MRI right away, the cost of your care goes up four times on average. If I don't do just an MRI- Just because you're, you're treating things related to what shows up? 100%. So it's just this weird, mm -hmm. like we're, we're humans, right? We're fallible, we're persuadable. Um, and we just gotta be careful like what we're telling people. We don't wanna just hide information from them, right? That's, I've worked around pro athletes where the, the training staff or the team physicians were like, we don't tell athletes anything. And I'm like, well, it's kind of their body. Like at some point, where's that like, you know, not a good relationship to have with the athlete, but I can also understand where they come from. Cause it's like, you're saying like, when do we yeah. tell them? When do we let them know? What do we tell them? 
Um, that's a hard, you know, there's no defined answer. There are no black and white, but it, it's a tough thing because it's, it's, it's an abstract part of what we do. We think it's very concrete. You tore a rotator cuff. We're going to fix your rotator cuff. We're going to rehab it. We're, we're weird, right? There's a lot of stuff. At play. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a whole spectrum because yes, you, you could have a terrible effect on the athlete's mind and therefore body if they learn that they're having an injury that maybe actually isn't the source of their pain and may not have anything to do with it at all maybe they've had that tear for 10 years and it's it's just showing up now but then also if you withhold information then sometimes you get it wrong and Mm -hmm. things show up later you know five years or maybe two years later the athletes on another team and they're wondering why they weren't told about a tear two years earlier so i i don't know what the answer is but it seems like each situation would demand a different different Mm -hmm. look or or different sort of strategy yeah and those are all great points it's tough it's tough yeah yeah so when when you talk about the the space that you fill at the farm which is your practice what, what's the what does it stand for again the, the full uh, farm abbreviation functional yeah functional athletic rehabilitation and movement and that's also the youtube channel right it's under the farm yep. yeah so, so when you when you talk about filling the space for athletes between the surgery or injury and a post uh, a, a post injury protocol where you're building back up strength like like th- actual developing the movement patterns and manipulating movement patterns that led to the industry in the first place what are some of the ways that you work with professional athletes to work out their body map for something like a, a golf swing or a, throwing a baseball and, and how do you improve upon that yeah uh this may seem backwards but we try uh my wife and i were having this discussion my wife's also a chiropractor in here and specializes in gymnasts um we're getting ready to open a gym that will be largely based on developing athletes not just building strength speed like do you move well do you have a good like chassis to throw stuff on well, we were kind of talking about, well, we may get into a big soccer base. I've never played soccer in my life. Soccer's huge here. It's, I think it's huge everywhere now. And she was like, well, I need to yeah. learn a lot more about soccer. I was like, do we? Or would we actually be better off to not know anything about soccer and treat every athlete, kid, whatever you want to say, pro athlete at first? I get, we'll talk about the levels here. At first, like we don't know what sport they mm. play because this is not my quote, mm. but the further you get down the continuum of being a professional athlete, the less human you become because you can become hyper-specialized. So you get away from like, I can do general human things. I can do baseball pitcher things. Though there's a, a fine line to toe there where all of a sudden you can't go back one way or the other. Um, so I think at first we try not to know what sport they're playing or don't look at their movement based on, you know, if it's a pro golf or baseball player, tennis player, just saying, mm. what can you do? And that's, you know, across energy systems, aerobic capacity, how they move. I mean, we're looking at pro athlete. We're looking at everything, right? Diet, lifestyle, environment. Now, there are differences that need to be addressed for somebody that's going to be a, you know, Olympic sprinter versus baseball player. Obviously, one's a rotational sport. All these things come into play. So I need to know the specifics of what they're going to go up against so I can determine how do I build resiliency and what motor patterns need to be at play. But I think the magic of pro athletes or treating pro athletes, and this would probably be across the board if you talk to people at a high level that are doing this, you're usually going back to fundamentals. You're not doing this fancy high-end training. It's like they're losing fundamental human movement. We're restoring that while they're constantly doing their sport. It's like we're use golf, unilateral rotation over and over and over. Uh, You know, rarely are they swinging the other way. And then what are we doing? We're trying to get stuff to move like it should not just golf, right? And that's, we're talking to the pro level because they've yeah. already built up capacity. Now getting a kid to a pro level is a very different continuum, right? We have to build the capacities first. And hopefully if we do it right, we don't lose as much of the fundamentals along the way, mm-hmm. which would be the real like, man, you are doing an awesome job at that point. Um, but yeah, I would say the, big, yeah. the first step is admonish ourselves of what they're actually doing. Second would be pay homage to it, but don't be chained to it. 
And then third would be always go back to first principles or fundamentals and make sure that like we're adherents to those who are not just playing around in like their sport specialty. And then they can't, you know, we wonder why they keep banging up their elbow or knee or whatever. And it's, you know, they're not, they're less human. So you'll look at the movement and you'll analyze the movement pre-sport. You won't say this is a good movement for golf. You'll just say, is, is this is this good or not, regardless of whatever function this is serving? Yeah, and I, a really good example of this is running, right? I see a ton of runners, mm -hmm. a, a variety of levels. So a lot of people that come to me will have gotten some sort of like coaching, Hey, can you like drive your knee higher? Can you push harder? Can your foot land here? Um, this is kind of getting deep into the weeds, but why not? So if you look at yeah. what's called dynamic systems theory, which is not a, a, you know, a movement theory, that's an engineering theory, right? More or less, or like quantum, mm -hmm. it's actually quantum physics. Um, what it's kind of talking about is like, why do things do what they're doing? So these attractor states, like I'm going to as a human be able to raise my arm up so I can pick things up overhead. Well, the only reason I would do that is if there's things up over my head, if there weren't ever things like that mm -hmm. as I'm developing, I wouldn't have shoulder flexion. Well, if I'm a runner yeah. and my foot's landing a certain way or in a certain position, the better question to ask instead of saying, can we get it in the good position or the idealized position is why are you doing it in the first place? Which then leads us back to mm. how does your ankle move? How does your hip move? How do you stabilize these joints, you know, individually and then globally through the kinematic chain? Um, and then that takes in like you just keep going, you know, it's like a Russian nesting doll. If we're looking at what your foot's doing, mm. now we're looking at what your hip's doing, now we're looking at what your body's doing, now we're looking at what you put into your body. So we know how the tissue quality is to, you know, all these things. What have you been coached at? And it gets bigger and bigger until you're like, I kind of have these three variables I'm gonna work on to see if I can change your foot position mm -hmm. and strike. And then if you can't, every once in a while, you are addressing the specific movement because that is a learned skill at the end of the day. But if, in my opinion, if we're a first principles approach practitioner, it's yeah. why are you doing those things? And we choose the most efficient path, movement, whatever it is, right? Work because of one reason. And the one reason only is lower energy expenditure, saving calories. It's easier. Like that's, that's what got yeah. us to where we are evolutionarily. And, and obviously an athlete would come to you because they want to feel better and, and move better and also get better results. That's, that's what you want to do. You want to perform as an athlete, but do you, like, I, do you care as much about the results? Not that you don't care about how the athlete is performing physically, but say you're working with a sprinter who's really fast and they're winning all their races, but you see something that could lead to something, uh, it could lead to a problem or an injury down the line, maybe six months, a year down the line, but they're performing really well. Like results wise, they're winning everything. Do you take into account the results? Does that not even enter your thought patterns? Like wh wh what, how do you uh, think about the dance between athletes wanting results, but also wanting to move better? Damn, Zach, you should get an award for questions. Cause these are like, you've already, you've hit two of maybe like the four questions that I'll probably think about my whole career. And this is the second one. Of, the, I mean, this is you sparking. I'm tr thinking back to all my, like my entire athletic career is like flashing before <laughs> my eyes. And it's, it's going off of your prompts. So I, I can't take it's, credit for all of it, but it's, it's inspired by this conversation. Well, so anybody that's in the distance running world will pick this name up, but I can give pr plenty of examples. Um, Priska Japtu or her kind of Americanized name is Rita Japtu was a elite marathon runner um, that had won the New York marathon numerous times. If you watched her run, it was like watching a train wreck. I mean, you'd be like, how is this happening? Right. You think her knees are going to mm -hmm. explode all these things, but the results were amazing. Now that's where the crux comes in. Right. So, I'm Tiger Woods. I'm killing it. And there's other factors. Obviously, we know with him, like what he was doing training wise, maybe not wasn't the smartest and stuff like that. But like if I have great results, but we're seeing mechanics, maybe overloading tissue, right? We see like maybe down the pipeline, gosh, I think this is going to happen, which is an impossibility. You cannot predict injuries as good as like, I think the best clinician on planet earth right now is Pavel Kolaj, the guy that started DNS because he was taught by the best. Mm. If you want to talk about a guy that can like, 
literally watch you move for two minutes and then be like, you've had this injury and you're probably going to have these injuries. And it's usually pretty wow. true. It's real, it's wild, but it's not magic. It's literally intuitive processes from thousands of pattern recognition, you know, swings. So then if I get somebody so he's that I'm like, like, he's like, a he's like a, the tarot reader of injuries pretty much. Yeah, you know, and, could look at you and be like, this, this is the outcome of your athletic life. And we've like, people have tracked it over time because you see so many pro athletes and, or, you know, or somebody in passing and it'll be like, you know, man, we think this is going to happen. And then like, God, it happens. And you're just like, oh my gosh. But, uh, you know, that besides, mm -hmm. cause some people may see like, well, what is that? And I mean, he just has amazing skills as a clinician, you know, but back to the movement piece of if I think something's going to happen, like I worked with a high level tennis player for quite a while that had had numerous injuries. That's why he called me in we started looking at how he moves in general and then on the court. And you can, for me, very easily see why his knee keeps getting banged up and he's had multiple surgeries. Mm. But in his mind, the results of what he was doing with manipulating the ball play were fine. And he couldn't piece the two together that like, because I was having him do something a little bit different that that would not only improve his performance, but save his knee. But you look mm. at a lot of the best in the world they are pretty good at like sparing joints and tissues, right? Like a Tom Brady that like, I mean, yeah, his biggest knee injury got rolled up on, right? It was acute injury. Like it's not these people that just break down constantly. Um, and that's what we want to pay homage to. And we can get in dangerous territory with doing that because we look at elites and how they move and we're like, well, we're going to move like them. Well, they're elite for, <laughs> for reasons, you know, that we may not own as the amateur, but I mean, that's an impossible question to ask or answer of, do I change mm. movement if results are great? <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, if you have been with somebody for 10 years, you know, you're working with them, like you're going to know their body probably better than them. You're probably on top of that. But let's say you get called in as that consultant, right? Like, hey, results mm -hmm. aren't great. And I use movement as my input to change the results. I think that's a, you know, that's a sure we're going to go after it. But then like I had a golfer the other day that flew in we were treating him for an injury or kind of a movement thing post injury, his golf game. And I even told him, I was like, your golf game is going to become just pure shit for a while. Right. Cause we're literally changing everything <laughs> about your swing and he's a high level golfer, pro yeah. golfer. And that's worrisome for him because that's how he makes money. Um, but the whole thing is if you, in my opinion, and I have to, <laughs> I have to make sure that this is a grounded opinion um, of, you know, substantiated mm -hmm. objective outcomes, like this is the thing that's going to be the best for you long term. It's not just my, you know, my, you know, unfluting opinion of just do this thing because I think it's right. And then we, you know, you pay creed to like, hey, put in the time, motor control, go through the process. And pretty soon it's like that swing is far more efficient for your body, but also the results are actually better too, which is now happening. And it's always fun to get the call or the text like, holy shit, this is like swing speeds up five miles per hour. I'm just killing it. I've never done this before. Like. You know, so that's, it's a yeah. hard question. Like you said, it gets back into that N equals one type, like everybody's an individual, but I mean, there's people that are out there today and top level sports that you look at what they're doing. You're like that God, something's going to happen and it may not. And it yeah, may. that's a, that's a tough sell to a professional athlete to say, listen, you're going to play like shit for maybe a few months and possibly longer than that. But a long term you're going to be better than you are now and you're, it's going to be reflected in your performance and earnings. I imagine a lot of pro athletes will be like, fuck that. I'm, you know, why would I change something if I'm getting good results right now? And it's also a lot of trust in someone like yourself or another, uh, someone else who works with athletic movements and, and trying to make athletes move better. It's a lot of trust for an athlete to put, in that person and say, okay, I'm going to take the decrease in performance as a signal of something that's supposed to be happening. That's good for me long-term rather than try to do the quick fix or, or, or mm -hmm. keep doing the thing that's going to get me the results. Which again, could be scenario driven. If you're two years away yeah. from thinking you're going to retire, probably not worth it. Right. But if you're, yeah two years into your career and we're seeing that, man, this could be a major upside. Sure. Go for it. And then everywhere in between, like, where are we at in the season? How much money is on the line? Like all those things come into play to factor in these decisions. And 
you know, uh, the tennis player example that I was using before, I mean, we entering that scenario was on the back end of a surgery. So we had all the time in the world, right? We kind of had a break. We had determined like, we'll take as long as it needs, whether it was, you know, like you said, the trust wasn't there, you know, from his end to me, or I didn't communicate correctly, but like somewhere in there, something got lost and it was just like, he was going to stick to his guns regardless. And then I kind of had to step away mm. from the scenario because I think that's what I would do. Even if you were my patient and I was just trying to treat you for low back pain and you're like, I'm not like buying what you're saying about these drills. And I'd be like, I, this is the best, in my opinion, the best thing for you. And if you don't have buy-in, I can't imagine how I'm going to treat you. So it's no different from pro to, you know, the mom or pop that comes in here. Yeah. For back pain. Yeah. A, a lot of our listeners are athletes. I know that. So hopefully they won't mind me bringing up baseball again, but it, uh, I, I had this, point in my career that was about 12 to 16 months when I was a sophomore in college so 19 20 years old where I was an elite pitcher with if you looked at velocity and results as a lefty but I think that I created a lot of that velocity I, I went from you know 82 miles an hour to 90 93 sometimes 94 and I think I created a lot of that velocity in ways that were not good long term. And I ended up mm -hmm. I ended up having two ulnar nerve transpositions in my left elbow. Um, and you know, I just want to say I was playing in college, so I, I didn't know. I'm, I'm not dealing with the same burden of having to pay my rent with sports. So I I'm not saying like I know what that that feels like at all because I don't. But I, I I do think that there are a lot of ways to create velocity and unsustainable patterns. And I picked up on a pattern that was working almost instantly and was kind of just pushing that to the brink. And I was like v driving very hard off my back leg and, and doing things that I didn't have the, the thoracic mobility to maintain over a long period of time and was seeing the radar gun go up, but then also having some pain in my shoulder and elbow that I was ignoring, but I, I saw the results and I was like, you know, it, this has to be good. If I'm going from 87 to 91, there's no situation in which this would be bad because that's what you want. You want to, you want to throw harder shit. And as a lefty, I'm luckier that if I, if I'm not throwing 97, people would still look at me because I throw left-handed. So I was like, oh, this is mm -hmm. perfect. You know, I might've a shot to play after school. And eventually, uh, my hip and elbow started breaking down. Long story short, got two ulnar nerve transpositions and then had the very humbling process of learning how to throw harder, but in a more, uh, in a kinder way to my mm -hmm. body. And D didn't get back to the point velocity wise where I was at before, but I, I was not in as much pain. And yeah, the, I, I was right at the point before these pitching labs were becoming popularized. And I, I put all the responsibility on myself. I, I could have flown to another area. I was in Richmond, Virginia, could have flown to a pitching lab, get my mechanics analyzed even before I started feeling pain just to have an idea of how my body worked. But there's as i'm talking to you right now it's it's making me realize that there are a lot of ways to get results but not all of those ways are sustainable mm -hmm. and healthy and one of those things is getting that spike in velocity there's like a thousand ways you can do that but you know there's probably only a few for my body type in particular that would actually let me be a healthy pitcher and throw hard at the same time and that's uh, going back to like the earlier question of changing mechanics and, you know, an athlete for results, the best way to kind of think about this is there's really, there shouldn't be an opinion <laughs> on the best way for you to throw the baseball, right? We can have the, the yeah. whole thing that breaks people is really idealized concepts of how to do something. This is how you pitch best. No, how Zach pitches best is very different than how I would, or, you know, Greg Maddox or... I mean, uh, as funny as it sounds, I, uh, with my little girl, I was watching, uh, Disney's the rookie with Jim Morris, right? Like started yeah. throwing heat. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a silly, it's a silly story, but why? Well, he had two shoulder surgeries. He had rehab, maybe stuff changed, right? Neuromotor patterns. And all of a sudden he's throwing 10 miles per hour faster than he ever did. Like that's 
doesn't happen for just no good reason, mm. especially as you age. So that's what I'd say is like the way that we base what we're doing off of is what? A, you know, structure determines function. So we're all built a little bit different. You can have, you know, if you're an early age baseball player, like the likelihood of torsion around your humerus through the roof. Okay. If I played other sports or I got into it late, that's going to be different. The amount of, like you said, T-spine rotation, the depth of your hip socket, motor control, right? If we go back to the clinician, Pavel Kolaj, one of the, he was a gymnast uh, for the Czech Republic. People think that why he's so good at being a clinician is he has fantastic like neuromotor skills, like feedback of his own body. So when he feels your body, he just knows what's going on because his feedback's through mm. the roof. Well, welcome to the best athletes in the world, right? Like you said, you were able to increase velocity stepwise in a fashion that maybe wasn't the most efficient thing for long-term benefits of your elbow, but why were you? Because you're a good athlete and you can move around little hurdles of, that your body throws at you, which is called adaptation. The whole thing we need to suss mm. out is, are adaptation and pr progress the same things? No. Adaptation occurs regardless of what you're doing, right? Me sitting in this chair, I'm adapting. Is that progress? Maybe not, right? Is that getting me to a more beneficial yeah. place? If I want to sit better, cool. But like, if I want to go hit a golf ball better after this, no. Um, yeah. So we just kind of have to always be careful. Of like, what are we basing things off of? Is it my dogmas around the sport, the movement, or is it actually, you know, that that is first principles. That's what I try to teach the students that I mentor all the time. Like, you have to understand the basics, biology, physics, chemistry, biomechanics, um, physiology. If you understand those, nothing gets through the filter that's like dogmatic opinion ideology. You're just like, well, let me go throw it through yeah. this filter real quick and be like, it doesn't make sense. Definitely doesn't make sense for how you move. And then we go back to the drawing board versus like, well, this is how Tom House would teach somebody to pitch. This is how, you know, X, Y, Z, like, no, it's, it's always based on assessment and individual need. Yeah, you're like the the Elon Musk of movement. So he's like, uh, <laughs> Na NASA tells him it costs five hundred million dollars to build a spaceship, and he's like, "Why?" And they're like, "I don't know. It's just always costs like half a billion dollars." And he's like, "Well, you know, maybe we should make try to make it for five, and you know, also, uh, not every pitcher has to move like this. Uh, if he, if uh, <laughs> Elon That's Musk a, ever got into sports, shiki. but no." It, Sashiki Toyota, that's the five whys, right? You ask why five times, that's how it, Toyota became the Goliath that they are. Like they just kept yeah. redefining industry norms because they're like, well, why? It's like an annoying little kid, but yeah. that's literally what we do in our clinic every day. Why are you having an ulnar transposition? Why did it get there in the first place? You know, why, yeah. why, why? And then pretty soon you're like, oh, maybe I'm working on this. So I'm sure there are hundreds and thousands of examples of going back to first principles or, or first principles exposing tradition. I'm sure there are thousands of examples of that that you've come across. Are there any through line examples in your practice of first principles exposing traditions that cross the sports barrier where it's, it's a way of thinking or, or certain movement that you consistently see that people are just doing because they've been told they have to do it this way or it's been done this way for decades? Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of outside of sports, but obviously it applies like breathing and postural, like, you know, kind of rib cage torso mechanics. The most common sports that we would see, I would say, non idealized coaching would be things like gymnastics, cheerleading, dance, right? Girls get taught to draw mm -hmm. in their abdomen, go into hyperextension, hang out with rib cage in a flare position. Good luck stabilizing your lumbar spine. What's the number one injury in all three of those yeah. activities? Low back pain and usually an extension-based injury. So that's one of the through lines it's, that people get taught. They're like, well, aren't I supposed to brace my abdomen and suck in? And like, no, the same guy, Paul Hodges, that is the most cited researcher in the world across whatever profession you want to talk, over 26,000 citations, is the guy that did the draw in your transverse abdominus research and like, I don't know, mm -hmm. I think the 80s. And then came back in 97 and said, no, it was wrong. It's all about intra-abdominal pressure and how you build pressurization with, you know, a, the ability to use your transverse abdominus is important, but not how we thought it was. So that's a through line that, I mean, we're just, that's a hundred percent first principles. Like we've got to break bad habits, reinstall new software, and then build upon that foundation over and over and over. It's super boring. A lot of people don't 
quite, <laughs> it's hard to conceptualize like, well, why am I gonna do this like low level boring stuff for my back pain or mm. how to throw a ball faster. But like, if you ain't got that, I, I just think you're always gonna be missing something. Yeah, that, that was actually the, I believe the first video that I came across on the farm YouTube channel was the diaphragmatic breathing. And I, I've been, I've been given similar cues with weightlifting and certain movements and pitching, but something I've never done is just every day work on breathing for a period of time, whether it's in the morning or, you know, a break in the middle of the day. And I've been fitting it into my schedule and, and following the video and you guys can check it out on the, the farm YouTube channel. I'm going to link it in the podcast description, wherever you're watching or listening to this, but it's, I'm, I'm like feeling my lower back and abdomen fill up in ways that I've never actually paid attention to and really trying, you know, not to breathe through my chest, but letting it fill up first in my abdominals. And it, it's something that, yeah, it's, it seems super basic. Like why would you have to learn how to breathe or relearn how to breathe? That's like, you know, uh, like like i'm gonna learn how to drink water or something you're just like why would i spend time doing that but it's it, it is something that you know i'm i'm learning and, and i'm i suspect i'm always going to be learning is that there there are better ways to do the simple shit and one of the things was the diaphragmatic breathing well and I'll kind of call myself out on this so andrew huberman i'm trying to look real quick which is a great podcast for anybody listening um, he yeah. had a guest on not too long ago that is, I'm um, looking up his name, so I don't blank on it. Um, fantastic, uh, researcher out of Stanford, but it's Jack Feldman. And they were just kind of breaking a little bit of the semantics, uh, issue with diaphragmatic breathing. Cause you're always using your diaphragm, right? So I, I'll call myself mm -hmm. out on that. What they were saying is most people are in this, what we call secondary respiration pattern, right? That they're just dominating movement with the muscles of secondary respiration, right? Your intercostals, your scalenes, your SCM. The reasons why aren't a hard, fast rule, but there's a lot of postulation that it's what I'm doing right now. I think you're sitting as well. You change yeah. the dynamics of how you stabilize your uh, torso. We're relatively young in the evolutionary uh, timeline of upright posture, uh, which kind of puts demands on our body that have never been present. We wear tight clothes. We get taught to suck in. We play sports that like teach us to do things. And then pretty soon we have this kind of manifestation where we've literally broken the one thing that like creates what we call low threshold strategy, the ability to stabilize your central, the central aspect of your body very easily and efficiently, regardless of the thing. Um, but the other interesting note about breathing is that humans are the only mammal that can disassociate their breathing from their movement. So every other mammal mm. in the animal kingdom has a diaphragm. But in order for that diaphragm to work, especially at higher levels of threshold, right? Running, sprinting, jumping, the movement dictates the movement of the diaphragm. So the best visualization for this okay. is a cheetah. So as a cheetah runs, right? It extends its back like a U shape, and then it flexes its back kind of like an upside down U or it's like an accordion. That is pumping their diaphragm. Um, if they didn't do that, they wouldn't be able to breathe as hard as they were. That's why like cheetahs don't pant and things like that. The reason we can mm -hmm. uncouple that is tied to like our endurance prowess. So I'm, I'm going to wrap a nice bow on this. The big issue we see in like culture across sports and then general pop is what people are <laughs> generally terribly aerobically conditioned, but yet they want to perform mm. and move really well. Well, the whole premise of good movement is aerobic conditioning because that's literally what your body's operating on to keep you moving, have quality movement, create good motor control. But rarely do we see any, you know, Cairo PT physician, even coach say, well, what kind of, you know, aerobic capacity? Like, are you, can you breathe efficiently? No wonder you would breathe through your chest. Like you, you can't even, you know, mm. walk up a flight of stairs. Of course you're in this pattern. And that's where I'll call myself out. Like, I've looked at a, a lot more versus just saying, hey, Zach, lay on my table. Let me teach you how to breathe through your belly and create pressure. Like why, again, that five whys, why would you do this in the first place? Is it just sitting and, you know, sucking in by the pool or is there something else going on? So there's a lot of things that play in yeah. our environment that dictate that pattern and um, thing being changed. But when something like breathing starts to change, that is absolutely vital 
to you staying alive, you better believe that something's driving that bus that's going to be a little bit hard to move the needle on, right? Yeah. Is there is there a most exciting way to work on your breathing that you found? Because because it can get a it can get a little bit boring sitting there and breathing in and and I, I've tried breathing apps. Yeah. I've done sets and try to do my own shit with it and walk around and breathe. Is there a way that you consistently come back to that's effective for breathing? Maybe it's paired with another exercise like walking or, or jogging, something like that, mm -hmm. that you, you find yourself not getting bored with easily. Yeah. I, and I'll break it into those two, you know, for people listening, it's hard to visualize this stuff, but like you were saying, the, the concept of intra abdominal pressure goes hand in hand with breathing, but the, kind of work on them then separately even though they're tied together so pressurization is coming from your diaphragm being able to depress against your pelvic floor and then the basically the muscular activation of your abdominal wall back against that pressure so it's just kind of your muscles like pushing mm. back against pressure well that's one thing you can work on and you know dns drills any exercise can i create pressure now breathing there's a lot of breathing stuff out there, right? Like it's just come into this like pop culture, you know, James Nestor's book breath talks about how it goes through cyclical mm. revolutions every thousand years. Um, that type of stuff is where all like, you know, nasal breathings become all the rage, which is kind of funny. But, um, when you nasal breathe, you're going to breathe in your belly easier. It's just the way that we're designed, right? Mm. So we're negative pressure breathers. So that's where we'll have people go out and do a run, light weight lifting, things like that, breathing through the nose, which defaults you into better intra-abdominal pressure and more belly mm -hmm. breathing if we want to, you know, quote unquote that. But I, I want to tackle one fallacy there. The whole idea that we're supposed to go out for a run and breathe through your nose the whole time or crush a CrossFit workout breathing through your nose is absolutely wrong. And I'll like, that's unequivocal data driven because there's something called a crossover point or respiratory threshold. And when you start working so hard, you can only off gas so efficiently. And the whole reason that we can use our mouth to breathe is not just when our nose is stuffed up. It's so we can be that endurance athlete that we were evolutionarily mm. designed to be. And if you rob yourself of that, you literally curb performance and not by a little bit, but quite a large margin. So it's just very interesting that we see all this stuff come to light and then very quickly becomes what dogmatic. I got this opinion. This is the best. Let's do it all the time versus like, it's good but like we're designed to do things yeah. a certain way over a variety of intensities and activities. So if you're, it, it can be good to only breathe through your nose for certain activities, but for, you know, if you're feeling the need to breathe through your mouth and you continue to try to breathe through your nose, it can actually harm you or harm your performance in some way. To a point, um, you know, there's a really good book called Jaws by uh, Kahneman's one of the authors, but it's talking about how, you know, we don't breathe well. It changed our draw structure and teeth malocclusion. One of the big things there is if you've patterned yourself to breathe a certain way through your mouth, you know, upper respiratory, you know, movement. If you go out for a run, what do you think you're going to do right away? Probably just default to <sighs> panting and breathing harder than yeah. you need, which sends a message to your central nervous system that says you're tired. <laughs> like right off the bat. I do that when I start th when, before when I, while I'm putting on my shoes, while I'm thinking about the run, <laughs> I start defaulting to mouth breathing. I'm like little running oh, anxiety. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. So what I would say is you work on it. So if you, you know, if you have that air hunger, right? You're like, man, I got to breathe through my mouth. The whole thing is, so if I like, I'll coach a runner, like a lot of people want to know, like, what's a real recovery run? Like what's zone two pace for me? Well, you could do the whole math method or you could do this, go out and run and only breathe through your nose, but slow down to the point where you can breathe through your nose comfortably, right? And then that's mm -hmm. going to be your pace where literally, yeah, there's going to be a little neurologic like shift over a week or two where like your breathing mechanics change, barring any like broken nose, navy, you know, nasal deviation that's like, you know, occluding anything, but you're going to change the neurology in your midbrain, which is where the breathing center is that says, this is actually the easier way to do it to a certain pace, then you hit that crossover point mm -hmm. and your brain's like, I've got to get rid. It's not bringing more air in. It's actually getting rid of CO2 faster, right? So you don't build up that kind of acidic nature, which then changes how you use oxygen. But that's what we're doing is like training yourself a little bit, but not saying I'm going to go crush. I mean, I've seen people that do 400 meter sprint intervals telling people to breathe through your nose. And it's like, 
that like there's no way you're yeah. running as fast as you can and your brain is learning that it's going to suppress your abilities your body's ability to run fast to make sure that you have enough oxygen in the tank to not pass out which is kind of a weird thing to train if you think about it yeah i feel like if you're doing something like a 100 meter sprint or a, a thousand pound deadlift or you know trying to throw a baseball 95 miles an hour you're breathing in those cases where it's very quick twitch that the force you're applying might be less than half a second for what you're trying to accomplish i feel like in those instances your breathing should just be what it is like if you feel 100%. like you have to breathe out of your mouth to do it like breathe out of your mouth if you have to breathe out of your nose breathe out of your nose but the, the action you're performing is so quick and such a controlled violent thing that adding another control on top of it i could see that derailing your performance yeah it's a rate limiter but the interesting thing about the three activities you pointed out just as a side you don't breathe in any of those if you're an elite 100 meter runner there's no breath right like they are literally like maybe one but a lot of people are not even taking a breath like you got to think like a typical breath really? in and out for me and you is like a five second interval, like a five second inhale, mm -hmm. a little gap, five second exhale. You'd be like, well, how's that possible? You may look like, look at a hundred meter runner. Like it's sometimes no breath, usually one tops two. Now, if you're running 20 seconds, wow. you're breathing, but you're also not elite. Um, but then if you're going to lift, you know, deadlift, we tell people not to breathe, right? Cause they're building massive intra-abdominal pressure. Mm -hmm. They're going to exhale at one point of the load, but they're not like breathing through it. And then mm. throwing a baseball, you may get like a tennis, you know, kind of grunt or something in there where you're using your breath to do what again, create more pressure to create optimal stability to create more force. So you're using your breath as a force reckoner or kind of a gauge versus using your breath to fuel the energy or the muscle to do yeah. the thing. That that's that's interesting that a hundred meter sprinters, the, the elite sprinters don't breathe or, or may only breathe a couple times throughout a sprint. Oh, Cause I'm picturing, I'm like, I, if I were to slow it down, I feel like I would be expecting to see them taking a ton of breaths, like on the step almost like, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're, they're not breathing or breathing very minimally. Now you get over a hundred change the ball game right 200 meter like mm -hmm. this is just very different you get out into 400 now we're in you know that's still elite tech technically like anaerobic for the most part but then like you get out beyond that that's where you know you'll see like i, I point this out all the time like Ilya kipchoge when he did the sub two marathon the nike project if there's a picture of him running with his pacers at mile 17 a sub two hour pace he's just breathing through his nose but why Mm. He is like elite trained. He's been doing it for years, like has probably amazing, you know, uh, neurologic control of his breathing centers. But then also this gets into a little bit of like the central governor theory, right? Like your brain will shut you down before you do. I guarantee you that Nike scientists were like, you know, until you hit a certain threshold, like maybe we use that just like I would use it for my recovery run. But he's out yeah. there at a top speed able to still like, gauge his breathing is like comfortable right which is insane to me that yeah. he's run like a four whatever he was running minute mile and just cruising at 17 miles yeah. breathing through his nose that, that's insane so with with wearing masks we've bas we've basically been doing a global experiment with how we're affecting people wearing masks for two years physically emotionally you know mentally when it comes to breathing do you think that the masks are going to leave us with any long lasting negative effects or even even positive effects? Do you think it won't really matter? Because I'm trying to visualize myself with the mask mm -hmm. and I feel like it makes me breathe more out of my nose when I'm working out. If I earlier in the pandemic, when you had to have your mask on in the gym, because if I breathed in through my mouth, I would kind of like suck it yep. in like a vacuum. So I'd be like, all right, I, I'm, it's more comfortable. I'm just going to breathe out of my nose or try my hardest. Do you think that the masks are tearing down our breathing? Is it neutral? Is it, is it actually helping us breathe? Like wh what do you, what do you anticipate in the coming years? So, you know, we kind of, if we're looking at what's going to come, we would want to look at kids. The big thing is kids already breathe like shit. Like that's proved like 
if you just walk around, like next time you're out, which maybe it doesn't happen a lot, you know, where you're at, but if you're in a public place with quite a few do, people it, around. It, it does. I've, I've been pretty good about getting out. I'm in Brooklyn. Um, I mean, I, I was very limited earlier in the pandemic, mm-hmm. like everyone else, where I could actually spend my time outside, but mm-hmm. I've always at least walked outside at some portion during the day. So if you walked, you know, say you're at a sporting event or something, just look around at all the kids like under age 14 and probably even above that. You're going to be amazed if they don't have masks on how many of them are breathing with just mouth open, just literally hanging out, walking mm-hmm. around. So that pattern was already set, which is far more deleterious than anything a mask will ever do. And like you said, a mask maybe offsets that a little bit funny enough, right? Because you're going to suck the mask in your mouth or the mm-hmm. mask's resistance to airflow, which is nominal would still be easier to breathe through your nose because it's easier to draw in more air through your nose. Like that's just the way it is, right? Mm. Um, for adults, I know this has been talked a lot, of, you know, about like airflow restriction. Does it change oxygen? Not really. Nothing shows that it does. And if it did, anybody that was wearing these in like the surgical suite for the last, you know, 60, 70 years, like we would see, you know, higher prevalence mm-hmm. of things like, you know, blood pressure issues and things that we do see with people like sleep apnea, right? The amount of like, high blood pressure, um, you know, increased risk of stroke, cardiovascular disease with sleep apnea is through the roof, which is a breathing disorder that Mm. I think is largely functional, not structural. Uh, But I don't think a mask is going to have a huge mass effect on how we breathe. Now, all the other things, social cues with kids and um, things like that, for sure. I mean, there's already literature on speech and developmental delays in children that are around masked individuals for the first two years of their life, which was our kid, which really worries me. Um, so yeah, that stuff's happening, but that has nothing to do with breathing. That's just us being social creatures that need to see all of the other stuff with communication. Yeah, that, that'll be interesting to see how social cues and social activities of younger children, cause you're building those social skills in your early years, how those skills are going to be affected by wearing the mask and, I was I was awkward enough without a mask when I was a kid. I didn't need any I didn't need I didn't need I didn't need any help to not read social cues or to not feel like talking to someone or feel stressed out in a social situation. So I, I feel I feel bad. I feel for the kids who are in that early developmental stage, even teenagers mm-hmm. in high school having to wear masks and go to school the past couple of years. Well, I always say that hopefully we're making a lot of badass poker players because kids are going to be able to read people's eyes like no business. But oh, yeah, we, you know, like it's been said that 90, 95 percent of our, uh, you know, communication is nonverbal. A lot of that's body, not just face. But like there's a reason we have so many facial gestures and so many little muscles in our face. And it ain't just to look funny, you know, uh, making a kid laugh like that. It's wildly important. Um, so it'll be interesting, um, stuff's changing already. So, you know, we'll kind of get after it, but it's a good lesson to learn. Like that had never happened before. So if we do find out it had deleterious effects on that, well, that also makes us change what we do in the future. If something Mm -hmm. like this comes back up. So at the end of the day, it may not be the worst thing. So I, I wanted to ask you a quick question on Tom Brady, because we, we kind of brushed over him before and I made a note to go back to it. So. I'm assuming you never you've never worked with Tom Brady. No. So this would be a completely uh, objective question. Maybe you're a Patriots fan. I don't know. I'm a Bears fan, sadly. When, but, Bears yeah. fan. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There, so so you've got uh, objectivity coming into this question. Well, looking at Tom Brady and just knowing what you know about his career as an observer and being a specialist in movement, what do you suspect is responsible for his longevity and success in terms of from a movement standpoint? Like, do you see anything that stands out to you where you're like, oh, wow, you know, Tom Brady's, I I can't believe he's still doing this at 38 years old, 42 he's moving like this he's uh moving his hips like this shoulder whatever it is like the connection between movements is there anything that stands out to you uh with tom brady uh taking away you know diet things that Mm -hmm. you don't really know just looking at him as something where you're like oh it makes sense that he's been performing at this level for this long because it seems like he's doing this way better than anyone else 
Well, if you go back to him being drafted in the NFL, you would say none of it makes sense, right? Pretty low draft pick, yeah. um, terrible performer at the draft uh, on m- almost everything. Uh, if you look at the pictures of him, right, when they just do the postural analysis of Justin Shorts, you wouldn't, you literally would not pick him out as an athlete. If you just put that up in a lineup, you'd be like, that's just a dude, right? Um, yeah. So unimpressive there, but then also a fantastic athlete because he also got drafted actually higher in the MLB than he did in the NFL, just decided not to go. I think he got drafted mm. by the Expos from, I'm, maybe I'm wrong on that. Um, Fun fact. Uh, was, it was out of high school and then yeah, he, he out of high school got drafted by the Expos and then got drafted in college. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's that's crazy. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, just a stud athlete like a lot of pro athletes are, right? Multiple sports, could do a bunch of stuff. But I really think because you look at that early like draft performance, his early career was kind of like, you know, he was behind Bledsoe and stuff like that. So, like, maybe he didn't get to shine early just because of, like, situation or scenario. The biggest thing is like that guy is a analytical beast that then puts information to work. I don't think it's anything from a physical talent other than it's not just hard work. Like literally he is, and this is what people, you know, when you hear Belichick and other people talk about him, he watches more film than anybody, but it's how he watches it. So if we talk about that 10,000 hour rule, that's kind of been dispelled, it's the intentional practice behind the 10,000 hours. His intentionality comes Mm. Yeah, with the physicality of how to throw a football and how to take care of his body, but it's the intentionality of how he studies how to do that stuff, right? So I think he is a great learner and then really good at putting that into action, which is actually the harder part of learning is actually taking the knowledge you got and doing Mm. something with it. Um, And I think that's why he made it so far and is coming out of his career pretty much unscathed. I mean, yeah, a couple of little injuries and a few surgeries, but I would say that's it because again, you look at him like obviously speed is not his friend. Um, he had, I mean, he also, the situation of why he was successful is probably different than why he didn't get hurt as much, but, you know, put him in a different line and he doesn't get protected as much and all these things. Like he may have not made it that far, but yeah, I would say it's his kind of like ability to break down, learn, um, and then put it into play is like probably far and above other people, which is kind of like Wayne Gretzky, right? Kind of the same thing, like mm. a great analyze, like really good feedback and environmental awareness on the ice but really good at the ability to like break down scenarios, pattern recognize, not have to go back and like reanalyze. Like I learned this and I'm not going to go back. Like I just boom, boom, boom. I keep moving forward. Whether that was reading a defense or, you know, um, how to do something a little bit different of throwing the football to offload something that may be getting bugged, which he did a lot of. Yeah. Yeah. You you said letting the information work for you. And I think that's a great way to put it because he – there's so many videos of him where he's obsessing over the analysis of a certain movement, whether it's his or someone on the defense. And everyone has that information. There are a lot of guys that spend time analyzing the movements of themselves and the way offense, defense works, whatever scheme you're trying to run. There are a lot of guys that analyze that, but it does seem like he's almost approaching it from an investment standpoint where he's going, okay, how can I leverage this information make it have the highest amount of returns as possible for me, almost like compound interest where he's not just writing it down, but he's using it in some way where that piece of information is going to get him more gains than the next QB who has the same piece of information, but maybe that guy only used the information for 30% of its potential and Tom Brady's like I could squeeze 70% out of this scheme Mm -hmm. that I just saw on tape and kind of just while you're there's that saying investing make money while you sleep it's it it almost sounds like that in a way where he's like how can I just take all this information in and then get the most out of it without actually having to uh, without doing more work than I have to do like there's no there's no point in working hard. Uh, obviously, Tom Brady works so fucking hard, but just like the 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 extra aspect of suffering just because of to, just to make yourself suffer doesn't seem like it really enters Tom Brady's mind as much. He's like, if I'm going to suffer, it's going to be because I'm getting better in some way from this information. Well, and I think really to get to the point of that or the heart of it is 
there's a very big difference between me and procedural versus understanding, right? So if, it, if you've read range by Epstein, he talks a lot about this, about how to learn. So I can teach you mm -hmm. how to learn multiplication tables, or I could teach you to understand how multiplication works. Two wildly different things. Tom Brady understood how defenses worked, how defenses reacted to him, not just how he needed to react. That's the big difference because once you understand, you don't have to go back. You don't go back and re look like, I'm sure he watched film year over year on the same teams, but like at the same time, I would almost guarantee you, let's say he's playing, you know, whoever it is, he's playing the Giants or the Rams or whoever it is. It's the same offensive coordinator, same head coach. He knows that they've been running the three games before. I guarantee you he's not going back and looking at last year's games. He's only looking at this year's. Mm. He knows what they did. Like, it doesn't make any sense, but other people will be like, well, I'm going to go back and see what they did. It, like, it's all conceptual understanding what's going on versus like, hey, this is what they do. Well, no, they're going to adapt to you. <laughs> so, like, if you don't understand what they're doing, like yeah. the actual, like, inner workings you're just you're literally guessing which is what a lot of people reading defenses are doing um my mentor another cairo brett winchester always talks about if you could put tom brady's like football knowledge in patrick mahomes body like good luck like patrick mahomes would kill him that's the differentiator right it's the base of mm -hmm. knowledge over those years it's not the athletic potential like mahomes is going to kill him on that end of the spectrum yeah so so i wanted to get into trail running because I know that's a, a passion of yours and, and something that you've written about and spoke to, uh, spoken about on the podcast. You've described trail running as a perfect balance of your passions over the last decade. And so as someone who has learned to despise running after my baseball career uh, ended because of, you know, the running polls, just shit show made me hate running uh maybe i'll get back into it one day so I, I wanted to ask you what drew you to trail running and what gives you that perfect balance what what makes it so balanced for you well going back to that you know kind of origin story of break my leg which we didn't mention is that the surgeon you know this is one of those should he have told me this was it right like told me hey there's a chance you'll probably never run again right um i think that stuck in my mind obviously because i still kind of like hit some points I tell patients about all the time, but, uh, because I was told I couldn't, well, I started doing it before I probably should have after the injury. Uh, and then honestly, I hated running too. I mean, I was a sprint athlete, right? Football, baseball, basketball, distance running was a joke. I didn't want to do it all the way through college. Um, and then it, the funny story of this is, which is partly true, but I was living in Alaska and my sister asked me to run a 5k with her. And she kind of said, you know, I need to do, get in shape and, you know, do this stuff. And I was like, well, I'm not going to train. I'm just going to go do this thing. And I got beat by a mom pushing a trike stroller, like in the last like, 800 <laughs> meters. Yeah. So like talk about yeah. humbling. I was like, oh my God. So I started that's, running. That's what more. I felt like. Uh, I just want to say that's, that's what I felt like this past weekend I was at a climbing gym just watching eight-year-olds <laughs> climb by me three times the speed and then do it again without taking a break I'm just like Jesus Christ <laughs> humbling right but it, it gives you a little yeah. uh, mo to get out there but yeah so I yeah. got B and then the way I'm built I was like well I'm not gonna let that ever happen again which is funny that like my ego took that hit but um well I lived in Anchorage Alaska so I just started running up flat top mountain if anybody's ever heard of that and running the local trail so it was really my environment dictated the outcome right uh i love mm. the trails and then when i got out of alaska i was like well run on the road sucks and i just kind of sought out more trails well then i had early success in the first trail race i ever did and uh won that which then catalyzed me again my ego got a little boost and i'm like yeah so it was really spurned by me being beat a competitive kind of drive to do better but then once i got into it and that's, I'm far more on this side of the spectrum now. Once I get into it, I was like, my God, this is like the best of everything, right? I, I'm outside, I'm being active. Um, for me, running becomes a massive, like, I just kind of picture like, you know, I'm on my MacBook right now. If my desktop had stuff everywhere, when I go run, I'm literally putting things in folders. I'm coming up with new ideas to write on the notepad. I get done with a run. Mm. Like, I feel just like, whoo to the point where like every once in a while my wife would be like, you need to go for a run. Like she knows like, mm, 
yeah, mm-hmm. you, you got to get out there, whether that's maybe that's for her benefit and not so much mine. Um, so so but, it's like closing your tabs pretty much like closing your mental tabs when you go run. Yeah, because it's it's just such a, you know, it's not like I zone out either. You know, I do have runners that come in here and they're like, if I don't run, that's the time that I just get to like turn my mind off. I think it's the opposite for me. Like that's when I kind of like turn my mind on, but not like, you know, how's my running gait? How's, you know, what's my pace? It's like, let me think about the things that I haven't had time to think about throughout the day. So it's kind of a moving meditation. Mm-hmm. And then it's just, do you voice honest. record? I, Sorry, do, you know, do, you, played, do you voice no. record or take notes? How do you keep track of the stuff you come up with while you're running? I've played around with that a little bit. Um, like when I was writing this book, I did because I would have so many like edit notes of stuff like, oh, I shouldn't mm. have said that. I should. Then I did. I typically don't. I'm just pretty good about, I honestly get back to my truck and, you know, have a journal and write down some stuff or make a couple notes on my phone. Um, but during like high level stuff, like presentation building, book building. Yeah. Cause it's just, there's too much. So I'll stop, take a note or, you know, sometimes I do it, but, uh, the, the, what I was going to say is the added benefit is honestly that it just, I'm okay at it. I'm not great. I'm not even nearly, mm-hmm. I'm just kind of good. So that's motivating for me to stay doing it because I can like do okay. Now, I'm going to be honest with you when I get maybe 10 years older and I'm not fast anymore (laughs) and I'm getting crushed by like Mm -hmm. 20 year olds, I hope I still love it as much and that none of that goes away. I don't think it'll change because I'm kind of getting on the other side of that already where I'm like, I just want to go out, take a nice run. I don't care how fast I'm going. I don't care to like challenge myself to like beat everybody that's going to toe the line anymore. You could do, you could do one of those videos. Have you ever seen the ones where, an athlete will dress up as an old man and then <laughs> compete against someone and like a power lifter in the gym, or I think Kyrie Irving did it in basketball. <laughs> if, if you get, if you get to that point where 20 year olds start blowing you away and running, you could dress up as a 75 year old and then they're going to see you underestimate you, maybe let a little bit off the gas. And then that's when you, that's when you smoke them. Well, I got called old for the first time this year in a race. Uh, I was, on the starting, like the front line and the starter came along and said like, Hey, if you're not running under this pace, like you need to back up. And I stayed up there and there were a couple of kids that were home from college. And, uh, one kid looks over at me and he goes, you going to stay up here? And I was like, yeah, well, I I'll toot my own horn. And I beat him at the end and he came up to me and he goes, man, you're pretty fast for an old guy. And I was like, Fuck. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. I'll, yeah. I'll take that sideways compliment. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You got to tell him you're going to stay up there and, and you're doing it. Cause uh, you told him, uh, you're doing it so you could win the race and, uh, d- do it for his mother or something. You're like, yeah, your mother <laughs> told me to stay up here and I'm going to, I'm going to show you how it's done. Um, if I was you're that quick witted right. when I was in that much <laughs> oxygen debt, I would have been all over it, but, um, it took a lot of effort to beat him. So I wasn't that quick witted at that oh, yeah. point. Uh, do you... Do you feel like you get second wins when you run? Because I have to be honest, I don't think I've ever experienced a second win <laughs> when I'm running. Or maybe I, uh, maybe I haven't run long enough or hard enough to get to what people call a second win. D- do you feel that? And if you do, where do you think that comes from? Yeah. Um, yeah. Another good question that like I ran a half marathon this weekend with my wife and this is a big part of the ultra running community is this sec, not just second win, but like untapped energy. Like you are absolutely crushed, not just like, oh, I'm a little down crushed. And then all of a sudden just back to normal or better than you were happens all the time, right? 80 miles into a run, all these things. I have never done a hundred mile race. So I've never been 80 miles into a run, but in this race this past weekend at mile eight, I was kind of like, man, I'm just like, you know, done two miles later, I'm yeah. running faster than I have the whole race. This is that central governor theory, right? This is uh, Timothy Noakes, who now is, you know, he went on kind of the whole running fitness thing. The lore of running was his book. And then it went into the kind of low carb diet. And now he's off in COVID land. But um, he's the guy that coined this term central governor theory that basically says your mind's going to shut your body down far before your body's shutting down to save you in case you had to run Mm -hmm. from another lion. That's what we're doing, right? Our body, us consciously we're overcoming that, that, that restrictor plate within our mind, which is the other part of why I like running is it's putting you in a scenario where you were challenged, but it's not life-threatening. Um, and humans used to be in life-threatening scenarios all the time. We're not, 
So if you can't somewhat mimic a scenario like that, I think you, like one of my kind of man crushes, Laird Hamilton in his latest book, Life Rider, he kind of talks mm. about like, if you're not facing danger every once in a while, like you're literally dying. Like your body's like, I don't need to do this. I don't need mm. to do that. And all your stress responses get turned way down. Well, then guess what happens? You have mild stressors, sickness, you know, mm. lose your job. Guess what happens? You don't, you can't handle that shit physiologically or mentally. So I think that's the other reason we do this stuff is kind of like train our brain without doing, you know, actual, you know, sports psychology or mental training. It's just kind of a, it's an active way to do that. Yeah. I, I think about that in, uh, in a similar fashion with Muay Thai. I started doing Muay Thai about a year and a half ago. And if it's a week where I'm sparring, I think this is going to be the hardest thing I do all week. You know, maybe I get punched in the face or, or kicked in the gut and that's like, that ends my sparring. I'm just like that. The, I'm, I'm done. Um, uh, which can happen sometimes with a, even just a leg kick if someone gets you in the right place. But I'll, I'll think about the concept of putting myself in danger and then actually going to do it. But then once I'm done with it, I know that nothing else I do that week or maybe even that month is going to put me in an, uh, a similar in a similar range of the danger meter. Like mm-hmm. sparring makes me feel like if I drop my hands, I'm going to get knocked the fuck out. So like this is a very dangerous situation right now. But in podcasting or Zoom meetings for work, you know, you can drop the ball and not suffer physical consequences. Mm-hmm. So I, I do like the way that Laird Hamilton frames it with, with you said, putting yourself in danger and kind of feeling, feeling those emotions. And then as a byproduct, your mild stressors then become low stressors. And then maybe your low stressors don't even seem like stress mm-hmm. anymore. So it's kind of a, uh, downgrading your, your fear response in a sense, it sounds like. Well, that's, I had a patient ask me this week cause we were talking about that race and they're like, how do they were asking me for advice? Like, how do I get to the point where I like running? And I was like, I pretty much fucking hate every race I'm doing at some point. Like I like literally I'm like every race, why am I doing this? Like five K's is the shortest race or the worst sometimes. Cause it's the hardest push, right? You're just sprinting for three miles. And literally, I think every race at some point, I'm like, why am I doing this? This is stupid. I'm running. Mm -hmm. Nobody's paying me to run. I paid to run, which is even worse. And then you realize like, okay, this is benefiting me far beyond like the 10 minutes or hour of like physical discomfort. Um, I, I also on the other end of that spectrum kind of agree with like Stephen Kotler when he talks about this like hedonistic calendaring, right? We're getting a little too far on the other end. Like people are doing like a hundred mile race every weekend and we need to go like, you know, cold bath at every more, like you can go too far down the road of like a good thing, right? That kind of like hormetic stressor and realize like, dude, it like you can pull back and still chill every once in a while. Like you don't have to just like Mm. put yourself in the gauntlet constantly. Um, That's where, that's my one struggle, honestly, with like the world I play in with like the ultra endurance world. It's not healthy. Yeah, It is absolutely not healthy to go run a hundred miles. It's probably not healthy to run a hundred miles a week, week on week. Um, but the mental benefits are amazing, right? Like the iron cowboy, like these people that are out there doing just crazy shit, mental, just ninjas, but like, is their body, this gets into that question, like just like our changing movement in an athlete, are they going to hit a limit where like their body ain't going to support what they're doing? And then it's kind of a sad thing because their body's what got them to that point in the first place. Yeah, it's, it, so I actually, I listened to the the two-part podcast that you did, Coming Clean, mm-hmm. and you were talking about the anxiety of your morning routine and some of the, it, it sounded like overloading yourself in a sense with your routine, but then it also could carry over into your exercise regimen. And you said, quote, I became anxious about not adhering to a rigorous wellness routine and that that's been a struggle of mine as well especially after college when you're not being given college baseball workouts and you're you have free reign over your morning routine you don't have to go to morning meetings anymore it's just like outside of your job no one's going to give a shit about your physical fitness routine your health routine except you so i I wanted to ask you what are the what what's the conclusion that you've come to so far about the way 
you've structured your morning routine that's most fulfilling to you like like today because it's you know it's probably going to change as time goes on but what are some of the things you pay attention to that tell you that yes you know this is good this exercise routine is good morning routine um the, the things that are hitting the points that you need to hit yeah and that's you know at first i was just trying a bunch of stuff so you gotta experiment you're gonna do a lot of things but then honestly i just what I probably didn't do a good job of explaining that video was I don't think I gave m myself enough time to actually see how those things made me feel on the long term, right? I was just doing them all because they were all mm. purported to have benefits, both, you know, whether it's anecdotally or research driven. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, cold bathe and meditate and do my morning movement and journal and, you know, everything nutrition wise. And it's like, it, I mean, if you're a Ben Greenfield and that's your job, right? Which mine kind of is like, I'm a health practitioner. I want to be an example, not just tell people to do shit I'm not doing. But like, if your job is to be a Tim Ferriss, Ben Greenfield, massive experimenter, you know, do all these things. Cool. Like that's your job. You're getting paid a lot of money. My, I got a family, all these other things where that's not my main thing is like telling you what to do. So that's where I kind of had to be like, well, all these things should be energy like couplers, right? I should feel like I can mm. do more. And like, that's what I kind of came to realize, like, I'm getting like anxious and like making myself wake up earlier to do X, Y, Z, to make sure I get it in, which is completely detracting from one part of wellness. Yeah. And it just became like, I don't think I had a regulator. I was doing stuff with no feedback loops, which is completely opposite of how I'd run a clinical practice. If we didn't have objective measures of how you're doing, I'm literally just doing stuff and hoping. Um, so I think I could have like, done a little less all at once and seen how each thing affected me. But I like basically like cut almost everything out, went back to, you know, just working out, doing some stuff and then I've added things in. Right. I still do a lot of cold plunges. I don't meditate. Right. Like I journal yeah. and I run like I don't sit down and meditate. And I did that for probably like two years straight. Um, but that's just like we're all individuals. Some people would say like you have to do that. I, you know, like I'm yeah. just that's not how I'm built, you know. Yeah, go I, going back to the the exciting aspect of doing something like breathing or a morning routine. I felt like I was in a similar boat where I was trying to fit in the, the cold shower, the gratefulness journaling, the mobility, the reading a quote, then going to meditate, and then going to meditate on that quote, <laughs> like just like all this all this shit um, that on its own on its own is it can have very positive benefits, but it was becoming a detractor where I would also start trying to wake up earlier and felt myself being sapped of energy from a routine that was supposed to add energy to my day. And the conclusion that I reached for now is I have a rotating, I have a rotating thing of activities that I'll pick for that morning but it has to fit within a certain time frame. So I'll, I'll work backwards where I say, okay, I'm giving myself 30 minutes. And mm -hmm. so if I can only meditate and write for five minutes, that is gonna be my routine for today. You know, if I don't meditate this morning, and I, and I do most mornings, but there, there are mornings where I don't, maybe I'll stretch out for an extra 20 minutes because I wanna, f I have more room in this time frame, but when I didn't put that cap on it, I was adding all these things without a limit. And then, you know, eventually it's like 30 minutes to 60 minutes to 90 minutes. I'm like, holy shit, like this is turning into a part time job doing this morning routine. This is supposed to be like leading up to me working, not the actual 100%. work. Well, that's this is something that I changed. I always did this, but it usually came after, like you said, this hour, hour and a half morning routine that I'd always do, you know, like Gary Keller says, like the one thing, the deep work from Cal Newport, like I would make sure like, I'm going to go do like, if I'm, you know, working on a talk or whatever, like I'm going to do that in the morning. That's just, that's the best time for me to like do it before we had other clinicians and before I had a kid, nobody was in my office either. I could come in here, you know, just like zoom through stuff in an hour. Well, when I wrote this book, I did it all in the morning, right? I get up at like 4 a.m. I would go out. Um, I think I did this subconsciously because I was writing a book on movement, but I made myself do like five minutes of kind of yoga flow, right? Just move out on the front porch mm. and then I'll go write. But I would write for an hour, hour and a half, sometimes two hours every morning, right? Like clockwork for the months that it put it, 
put it together, what I realized was for me, some people feel like they need to exercise first thing in the morning because it's not going to happen if it doesn't you know, happen then, which I totally get. For me, it's the exact opposite. If I get to the end of my day and I didn't do the work, right? Not, you know, I love my patients and I love all, like, that's not the work for me. The work is like building creative sources of like education, you know, on health and environment and performance to, you know, expel to a bunch of people. If I don't do that, I literally get to the end of the day and I'm like, God, I didn't do what I was supposed to do today. It, honestly, I'm at a point mm -hmm. in my life, if I miss a run, if I miss a workout, it's honestly less important to me than if I didn't do that work because I kind of got to ask myself, well, am I here to just like exercise my way to a hundred years old or am I here to do something of meaning, which then exercising and cold plunging and eating healthy props up. And that was a yeah. huge shift for me of like, oh, just, it could be 20 minutes, but like do something that like is big work. And that doesn't happen every morning. I mean, we all have shit that happens. And, you know, I would love to say I wake up and have a green smoothie and a facial and a cup of coffee and do my deep work, but it doesn't happen every morning. So, you know, that's the way it goes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a good approach, a good, a good way to look at it. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about the fat positive movement. And there are a lot of angles that we can take to discuss this type of, uh, this type of segment of the conversation. But I wanted to ask you uh, as a movement specialist, as someone who works with athletes and, you know, regular Joes like myself, uh, I, the fat positive movement has taken hold in the United States. And with that movement comes the separation of health from weight. So a lot of people are looking at their health and weight as two completely different things now if, if they subscribe to a lot of the things that this movement holds to. And so I wanted to ask you, as someone who's an expert in movement and helps people move better for a living, what is your view on this fat positive shift in thinking and the way that it's affecting movement as a whole? When well, I can imagine you're asking this question because I have put out some stuff on this, you know, that's just all opinion based. But I act I actually I, I haven't looked at anything perfect. specific like uh for you, for you. I've I've read things on it, but I haven't read what you've written yet. So this is a, you know, when you have a kid or if you have kids, it changes how you think about things. So let me preface it with this because I did put out, I think I put out a video or an article on actually it was something about like CPAP machines, right? Which is largely tied to obesogenic, you know, um, lifestyle or environment, but it turned into this whole like, you know, or do you think people are of less value because they're overweight? Like, I don't even know how it took that term, but it was this long social media rant. You know how that mm -hmm. goes. A, no, yeah. nobody is of less value because of anything. The whole thing is if my daughter was overweight, that would be tough, right? Because I'm sure that she's not, maybe I want her to be happy with whoever she is, but the whole thing that I want her to be happy in the face of something that's literally not healthy, like it's not, like for a variety of reasons. And that's unequivocal. You cannot say because you're overweight, that you're as healthy as somebody that is not. Now, you can be skinny and just as unhealthy as that overweight person, which is the other side of the spectrum, right? That we need to realize that it's not about body morphology. It's about what's happening mm -hmm. physiologically within that body that's actually more important. Because you don't also have to have a six pack to be mm -hmm. wildly healthy. So the whole thing yeah. is, we don't want to prop up something that's unhealthy with it's okay, which is just the whole politically correct movement, right? Everything's got to be okay because we can't piss anybody off. Well, that's not the way it works because science says otherwise, right? <laughs> it's the way it goes. So yeah. my thing is, I don't want somebody to feel bad about themselves, but guess why most people change? It's an internal motivator. And if it's intrinsically motivating, it's more powerful than me or somebody else, a physician saying, hey, you are unhealthy. These biomarkers are unhealthy. You still have to pick up some internal mechanism that says, this is my motivation. That doesn't mean I, I feel horrible because I'm overweight. It could be, I want to be 30 pounds lighter to be healthier, to be there when my daughter walks down the aisle, whatever that is. We've heard that old cliche numerous times, right? Mm -hmm. But my thing is we prop up a lot of shit that ain't healthy just because we don't want to piss people off or make people feel uncomfortable. Well, let's move away just for a second from the, you know, fat positive movement or whatever we want to, you know, call that and talk about like, mental health disorders and anxiety and suicide in teens. It's not something easy to talk about. And the reasons mm -hmm. why people are anxious and, you know, 
teen suicide is the number one cause of death of kids 15 to 19 years old worldwide. That's absolutely fucking insane, right? That's insane. Mm -hmm. And if we're not willing to have uncomfortable conversations that for some people may surround obesity, being unhealthy, feeling like they can't move and like, well, what's worth it, right? There's a lot of other shit that plays into it, I get. But like they're on the same spectrum because we don't touch things because it's it's non-PC, right? Or it makes people uncomfortable or puts them in a position that they have to realize they are different from other people, that we're not all the same. And I just, I cannot mm-hmm. adhere to that because I have to abide by first principles of science that's also led by my experience, which doesn't mean I'm just evidence chained. It means I'm led by it. But like, it's just, you know, it'd be crushing to me. Let's say if, I mean, my, <laughs> with the percent of people and kids that are overweight, my daughter's likelihood is through the roof. Like statistically speaking, mm. right? That she's going to be overweight. So I have to take that into account and be like, okay, I'm dealing with an environment that is expecting her, right? 74% of the US population is um, overweight, right? Around 46% is obese. So when we take those numbers, then I have to say, well, I have to dictate or deal with an environment that's leading her down that path almost regardless of what happens, right? School, food, whatever, yeah. parties, all that crap. That's a tough pill to swallow. But yeah, I mean, that, I guess that's my stance is it is not healthy. We need to realize that. Realize that just because you're unhealthy does not mean you're unhappy. It doesn't have to. If you have cancer, I hope you're not unhappy because you have cancer, right? Like that, it happened, yeah. right? It happened. Now, what do you do with that? Yeah, un- unhealthy doesn't mean unvaluable. You you can be you may, you may become a more valuable person if you lose weight if it's hindering you from doing the things that you want to do and be with the people you want to be with and you know express yourself. Yes, you can become a more valuable person if you lose weight in in certain instances, but the way like I I can't I don't have an expert opinion on this at all because I, I'm not an expert. I haven't done the research. I did a two hour podcast on the obesity epidemic. And, um, you know, in my unexpert opinion, there's so much research that shows the link between obesity and morbid obesity and all, co- all cause mortality and heart disease. It's just, it's just not questionable at this point. But, but if you take the science out of it, um, just like for a thought exercise Mm -hmm. from a philosophical standpoint, how can you feel better, express yourself, be of the the most valuable individual to society to achieve your own goals and also help other people. The way I've thought about it is this. If you take a 250 pound, a 250 pound person, let's say they're five foot eight, um, a five foot eight female, 250 pounds, they're, obese, morbidly obese, uh, you know, very overweight. If you said, okay, I'm going to let you trade in your body for a 150 pound body for one week. And you could walk around in this 150 pound body. You could go on dates. Uh, you could go hiking. Uh, you could have sex. You could, you know, sit, drink coffee, like whatever you want to do. You're, you're, not changing anything about yourself, just the the weight that you're dropping 100 pounds. And at the end of that week, you can take back your 250 pound body. I don't think there's anyone on this planet that would return their body after experiencing it for a week. And I've never been morbidly obese as an adult. So I don't know what that's like. I, I was in the obese category as a kid for a couple of years, but, but I don't know what it's like to lose that amount of weight as an adult and go through that and, and be looked at, uh, at a certain way, be, be looked at at a certain way because of the way that you look. And, um, you know, it comes with its own set of challenges and difficulties, but I, just from a, a, a standpoint of being like feeling good and being someone who, has purpose and helping other people. I don't see any situation in which the version two, the 150 pound person doesn't enhance all of the things that you're able to do at 250 pounds. Not that you're uh, a bad person at 250 pounds. It's just like, you want to do all this shit at 250 pounds. Like this will help you do it better why why wouldn't you want to do that and and there's a, the hard work that goes into it and and exercise and genetics and all this shit um 
But if you had the opportunity to to swap, I don't think there's a person who would not uh, take that opportunity. And that's a great thought experiment. And the the usefulness aspect is huge, right? If you like, let's say you can't get down on the ground. Let's say you had a three year old and you can't get down on the ground because literally it's so hard to get back up. Right? You just can't because you're hurting because of you know whatever. Mm-hmm. And you don't even have to be obese for that. Let's say you just have knee pain. And you can't get down and play. That's a lot of people's motivator to come into our clinic. You know what? I dealt with it until I couldn't do the things with my kid or my grandkid because we realized what? Even though that may be play, your usefulness as a human is going downhill and you are starting to realize mm-hmm. that. It just had to get to a higher level of interaction, which were social beings. When it gets to that level, that's where it kind of hits home. Also, that little bit of legacy piece when it's like your kid or your grandkid, you're like, God, that there's a timeline here to this stuff. The other part of that is that I think that that's really driving the bus. Like you said, you maybe were overweight as a kid. I kind of hit a little bit of that after the leg injury. Most people, and this is a sad thing, will never know what it feels like to actually feel good, right? Because kids are just wildly, yeah. they're going to have more acquired disease, be more overweight, they move less. So if you never know what it feels like, you never get the opportunity to, you know, in essence, trade in that 250 pound frame for the 150 because you never knew. So the norm is just that, right? The unhealthy, overweight, I don't feel awesome. I have four autoimmune diseases and take two medications. Like that's normal, right? Just because it's nor- or common doesn't mean it's normal though. And that's what we need to realize is like, we have to show people an opportunity or give them the opportunity to be shown like, what does this feel like? Um, and that's where I'm a huge proponent for like, you know, kids <laughs> moving early, uh, being involved in sports, doing things that get them active for a variety of reasons. And that stuff is just going away, like left and right. It's just being pruned out of our lives. And I mean, that's, again, that's an environmental dictate that's happening. So that's a much harder fix. Right. And that's the whole premise of the book yeah. is let's try to fix it on an individual level since the system is broken. Yeah. That, that reminds me of the way that Sam Harris has talked about meditations, he'll, he'll say meditation is kind of like piercing through the veil and sitting in that present moment. And if you don't regularly meditate, it's hard to have that ability to tap into the present moment on command in situations where you don't feel present. And, you know, I've, I've been meditating for two years and I'm still getting better at it. And there, there are many points during the day where, I feel like I'm not present, but I at least know what it feels like to be able to drop into the present moment in ways that I couldn't before meditation. And I feel like the same thing could apply to obesity, where if you haven't pierced through the veil of moving around, not and not in a, a muscular, you know, super mm-hmm. six pack, eight pack, kind of like the men's health physique, like not not that, just like a like a fit body that is pretty normal but otherwise fit and if you've never been in that body you don't know what you're missing you don't know how you're not moving or not feeling like it's it's hard to uh it's like asking people you know how many how many lives how many people don't die because of uh doctors like like it's it's hard to Mm -hmm. It's hard to put a number on the amount of things that don't happen. It's hard to put a number or a statistic on the way that you don't feel because you've never felt like that. So, yeah, it's I I think that's a good way to put it where you you might not even know what you're missing. Well, the scary thing is what if we can start giving people the 150 pound frame experience in the metaverse? Is that actually beneficial or harmful? Yeah, that's going to be a big question. I was actually just thinking that. Because you could show them what it feels and maybe actually through, you know, haptics and things like feel it. But then like, does that just sell you on, well, I'm going to just upload. I'm, I'm going to go over here and feel that all the time. Or I want to come back to the real world. And I don't know. I just, I don't know. You know, I kind of tap into that at the end of the book with the whole postulation with these kinesthetics versus non-kinesthetics and this divide. But I, I don't know. I That's happening already. You literally see people that are like, no, I don't exercise. Like I don't need to. I'm just like I'm. Bu- I'm buying real estate. I, I'm doing all this stuff. Like why would I do that? That is a thought. And then you, the opposite side of the spectrum is, you know, the move now. I'm gonna you know go full primal. Uh, not wearing shoes. I'm gonna liver king it up. Like you, you're just yeah. seeing the divide like occur. And then 
like most things, the middle, right? The normative middle is actually where we need to live. We need a little bit of both. So that's mm. the tough part. The augmented reality for changing your body and changing the way you could actually feel in your body is definitely intriguing. I, I see that I see that serving a purpose and giving people a better life and reality in, in their their actual life up to a point. Because if you could feel how it feels to be healthy before you're actually healthy, that could be a huge motivator where you come back into reality and you're like, oh, fuck, like mm -hmm. I was just running around at 150 pounds and now I'm sitting on my couch at 260 and I, I feel the same way walking to the fridge as I do running two miles in the other body. So... <laughs> I feel like that could be a good I feel like that could be a good spark to get people to be healthier if you were able to experience another body type in augmented reality in the metaverse but only up to a point cuz then you get to the stage of okay do I want to put in the work to have this body in reality or do I want to just buy this avatar like if if you could mm -hmm. If you could have a week free trial of your 150 pound self and then they're like, all right, do you want to just buy this? Like it's it's 100 <laughs> bucks a month. You don't have to do anything. Oh, I could see a lot of people just being like, yeah, like why would I do the work when I could just live in this reality? And and I don't think we're anywhere near that yet, but I, it, it's, it, it's an interesting thing to think about. When it's kind of, it's not exactly, but it's a little bit of a parallel in the psychedelic experience, right? People... Some people want to just live in that state so they keep chasing it versus like you're actually doing work to then pull back into, you know, the real world, um, which is kind of that you got to come back and kind of like process the stuff. I mean, that could, and I know there are already multiple companies looking at trying to create psychedelic experiences through augmented reality for that reason, that you don't have to go through mm -hmm. the neurochemical changes due to whatever reason. But yeah, I think that actually I hadn't thought about that a whole lot until now that there may be a benefit, but then with that benefit comes with anything, you know, a downside risk of people just kind of cashing in on that. Have you had a psychedelic experience? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm in a state where I can't say much more than that. Uh, not a state, like okay. psychedelic yeah, yeah, state, not but in a geographical state. Yeah. Um, but yes. Yeah, no, I, 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 I understand. Um, can, can I ask you not what you took, but the, the way you were able to integrate that back into your, your life in a non psychedelic state? Did, was there anything that you did like journaling or combining it with therapy, like ways you felt like you could integrate it back into your everyday experience? If you work, some, some people trip out mm -hmm. and they're like, I don't, you know, I'm the same. Did, did yeah. you feel like you were doing anything to integrate it back into everyday life? Um, maybe like a lot of Midwestern kids, I was a wild experimenter, you know, through college and even high school and stuff, which was, is not the same by any means, right? You can have experience, but that doesn't mean that you did anything with it. It's like Tom Brady studying and then literally throwing out the info. Um, but yeah, as an adult, I would say I haven't had any you know, nothing that's been professionally guided, you know, it's not like I'm going to some treat in Sedona and, you know, doing a week-long process or ayahuasca and everything. But I have had experiences where for me, it really is that kind of, it's almost like, and it's not almost, it is, you're looking at yourself like you're looking at yourself from another person, right? Like I'm having this viewer, mm. right? Or that observer effect. When you do that, even though you're not like watching yourself interact with people it's kind of a weird experience because you realize like to me and i know this may i don't know if it'll sound weird but like you are just a person like sometimes i feel like i hold myself to like you know i hold other people in higher regard and then you have to realize like they're just a person you're just a person we're all doing the same shit and like that's been a big thing for me is like the expectations we put ourselves under because i am just a human like you want to keep growing you want to do good things you want to be the best person you are but at the end of the day like still part of why you're here is like to enjoy this experience and not just like push yeah. and drive. And I kind of like, that's one of the bigger things I took away from one experience in particular was like, I could very easily just go through life and just do versus like actually like sit back and kind of be like, well, why am I doing that? Like, am <clears throat> I learning? Like, am I experiencing things fully or am I just like buzz on through life? Um, and that's probably the biggest thing that I've pulled out of that. So 
taking time to enjoy the spaces between work and then also to, that helping that helps you enjoy work more is that an accurate summation enjoying yeah, the spaces even like questioning you know not that i would just like up in myself and be like oh i'm done with the clinic but like it can be as simple like it doesn't have to be these like deep introspective things like is it actually fun to do what i'm doing on a daily basis like is there enjoyment in it or am i literally doing it just because i think like sometimes i think myself into this corner i need to be doing something that actually makes the world a better place which i don't think is a bad thought at all right but if that was the only yeah. reason i was here <laughs> You know, and maybe some people would say, well, you know, look at Jesus Christ, look at Mother Teresa, like maybe they didn't live lives of just like awesome leisure and enjoy everything. And they were, you know, selfless and I get it. But like, what if <laughs> I've never been in their brain? What if that gave them like pure joy, right? Like that's what they, tr like they literally weren't doing it yeah. because they felt like they had to, they did it because that's the feeling it gave them, which emotions are what drive most of what we're doing in life anyways. So I guess it would be, if I got more specific, is what emotions are derived by what I'm doing the most of. And if most of those emotions are a responsibility, like I have to feel like I'm doing it, right? I need to do it. I'm providing. This is my duty to mankind. Like, A, like who the hell am I to think that like I have a duty to make, like, yeah, I want to make the world a better place, but like, come on. Like, I hope I do something big, but like, yeah. I can't just like put myself up there, you know? Yeah, you got to have fun. I and there's so many examples of these altruistic, family-friendly figures who it turns out they were actually doing harm behind the scenes. And maybe it was because they were suppressing the mm -hmm. urge to enjoy life or they w were only willing to do things that would make them appear in a certain light to people in the public. And, you know, they couldn't they couldn't be seen, you know going to a baseball game or drinking at a bar or doing all this other shit because then people would say oh i thought you were supposed to you know be constantly in a nursing home or, mm -hmm. or you know constantly preaching or whatever and in a way i think you actually and, and this is me justifying my own selfish behavior but <laughs> in a way i think you're actually helping people enjoy life by enjoying your own life because you're mm -hmm. a, everything you do is a signal everything you do is a physical emotional mental signal to other people and when other people see that you're a generally good person and a, a high functioning person but you also like to go out and have fun then that's a signal to other people that i can also live a life like that and i don't have to suppress my urges or desires to have fun because I need to fit into a certain box. Those those two things actually feed off of each other. And by fulfilling the things that I enjoy may also lead to me being better at my work and then vice versa. And then when people pierce the veil to go back to that and actually see that, yes, you can do both of those things, that lets other people then see, okay, there's, there, you know, there are millions of people that do this and they're all good but no one talks about it and now people are talking about it so let's you know let's stop hiding shit zach can i go pee real quick <laughs> oh yeah, cool? yeah yeah so something something that i wanted to get into is actually the relationship between movement and big pharma or the lack of recognition of the ways that movement and improving your movement can actually help a human being as much or more than prescribing medications. And I wanted to ask you, I, I wanted to bring up a moment from the Lex Friedman podcast. I don't know if you ever listened to Lex Friedman, artificial researcher. Yeah. So he had Dr. John, he had Dr. John Abramson on uh, his show. And John Abramson is a medical researcher. He specializes in medical litigation and he's written a lot about big pharma and one of the topics that dr john abramson was discussing with lex friedman is how big pharma advertises the benefits of medication for example let's say something reduces heart disease as a benefit but big pharma leaves out the fact that a quote unquote active healthy lifestyle program reduces things like heart disease 
far more than medication. So big pharma essentially tells you the benefits and they tell you the the symptoms and the, the side effects that can occur and the symptoms that it's treating. But they there's no statement in these infomercials that says, by the way, this hypothetical medication doesn't reduce heart disease nearly as much as active changes in your lifestyle. And so I wanted to ask you, what is big pharma leaving out about movement? What what problems do you think that we're medicating away that better movement may actually uh, improve to a better degree than medication or just like only relying on the the reactionary approach to big pharma? I mean, I don't think this is a... Uh... I don't think this is hyperbole, but the opioid epidemic is largely due to musculoskeletal burden, right? As I talk about in the book, the musculoskeletal burden or the, you know, injuries, pain, whatever you want to put that, you know, umbrella over, like that's the biggest burden in the world. And if we are on track, if we keep going the way we're going, like we'll spend all of the U.S. budget on musculoskeletal issues by 2035, right? <laughs> it's insane. So then yeah. you kind of wonder, you look back at like, well, what started to become worse and worse, right? As we move from like the fifties, right? Like maybe the height of like us power. And then we started to see like, man, our health started getting worse economy, you know, yeah. It roared up in the eighties and then, you know, back down again. I really think that like, as our personal health got worse, it was obviously this, uh, disillusioned relationship between a human and movement. Um, not my opinion, right? A lot of health things go by the wayside as you move less or, you know, whether that's through your day or just reduce your exercise. The big thing is like opioids work, right? That's the shitty thing. They work. They're just highly addictive and they're usually prescribed for the wrong reason. That's the big thing here. Like I just mm. saw a friend of mine today that had shoulder surgery. I'm glad she has opioids, right? I know a lot of people choose not to yeah. use them. A terrible pain. I mean, if you ever had like a bone cut on and like a tender, like that's terrible, man. Like there's a reason that they give people finagrin when they have these surgeries. It's usually not because the, the pain medication makes you nauseous. The pain does, right? Like it, you can pick your poison yeah. there. But the whole thing is, is the misappropriation or the misprescription, um, you know, an off-label prescri prescribing is not, I can't really speak on that because I'm not a medical physician, but like it happens a lot for other drugs. When you look at opioids, if you go to the ER, let's say you have low back pain. One of the most common musculoskeletal mm -hmm. things that enter the ER is low back pain. It is also the worst thing you can go to the ER for. So anybody listening, never do that. Because what they're going to do is they're going to give you an x-ray and depending on how bad it is and your history and your age, maybe a CT scan, they're going to give you muscle relaxers and a painkiller. This starts mm. <laughs> many of the addictions for people with like a benign episode of back pain, but also... I won't knock them a benign nurse practitioner, PA or medical physician saying, well, I just want to get you out of pain. They're literally, I just want to get you out of pain. And then somebody has that neurochemistry lock and here we go. Now I know your question wasn't specific to addiction, but then when we look at what are we leaving out of the, the propaganda, right? Or the advertising for movement versus uh, medication. Like, I don't think this is a public service announcement problem, right? I don't think it's up to, if I'm in the, business of selling cheeseburgers at McDonald's, I really don't give mm -hmm. a shit if you eat a salad. I'm just being honest because that's a capitalist model, right? The whole thing is we're removing it from people's daily lexicon and general knowledge at a much earlier age. So then by the time that we watch that advertisement where we can actually conceptually understand it, we don't have any information to go against it, right? Nothing says like alerts us that like, well, shit, that. Why don't they talk about this? Just like COVID has brought that back to light, right? Why don't they talk about being generally healthy and like not obese and like taking a couple supplements and you'd actually be healthier? It's the exact same thing. Well, nobody really talked about that before. It only became popular because a lot of people started dying, right? Um, for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing. I think we're missing true health classes. Physical education is gone from the curriculum for the most part we don't understand how we operate, which is the whole damn reason I wrote the book. We literally don't even understand like us, yet you're stuck with this thing for as long as you're here. And this is the most poorly understood thing on earth by the most people, yet we all got one. We all got a body. 
Yeah, we yeah. just roll around like we're like, mm, shit, like, yeah, I'll just let somebody else take care of me. I'll go to, I'll go listen to whatever they're going to say. I'll take whatever drug they tell, you know, I get it's high level stuff, but like, you know, I don't know. I tell the story all the time that like I had a patient that, you know, fake hip, replaced shoulder, was beat up, coming into me for pain. She had just bought a new Porsche Panamera and she's telling me as she's lying oh, on the table, yeah. like two days after I had, um, or we had kind of the visit before kind of had this little hash out of like, mm. Hey, you're not doing your exercises and stuff. That's why you're not getting better. Like, I'm not here to just like do duct tape, right? You gotta, we gotta do stuff at home. She literally tells me, you know, I've been back to the dealership three times since I bought this Porsche because I can't figure out how this thing works. It's so complex. Mm. Yeah. She won't take like 15 minutes, 20 minutes to like, you know, understand her body, do the things that would actually benefit her short term and long term. And I'm like, yeah. well, there's the irony of a human right there. Um, and I mean, you, that is the hardest thing to combat is because we're not logical beings. We think we are, but emotions and basically what, um, Rory Sutherland that wrote alchemy calls psycho logic. It's not logic. <laughs> we don't do things cause they make sense. We do things based on emotions and how other, per other people perceive us as like most of what we're doing in the world. So if you can tap into that at an early age, right, that subconscious cueing before like seven, eight years old, and then all the way through teens, that's the home run. But maybe from a policy standpoint, if you sell drugs, you pay for that shit in school. Like that would be a great idea and they got plenty yeah. of money to do it, right? And then we don't have to worry about the budgeting issues to pull tax money in to pay for that shit, which is why it got taken out in the first place. Yeah, it's like you're talking about drawing people in and getting people excited about making certain changes. It's like real life thumbnails. Like if you, if you see a thumbnail on YouTube that pulls you in and makes you want to click on it, you're going to watch at least part of that video, if not all of it. And the same thing applies to making changes, whether it's health, fitness, relationships. There has to be some sort of selfish desire that's going to excite you to want to make yourself better. And yeah, I like, is it, I don't know. The, the solution is obviously it's multifaceted. How do you, how do you get people to want to learn more about their bodies and how it works, but how can you make the thumbnail of health and fitness and movement more exciting for people to click on in real life, as opposed to, popping a pill and getting rid of a problem temporarily. I think this is, uh, so I was a marketing undergrad major and, uh, by the way, you should, everybody listening should read that book, alchemy. It's an amazing book. It literally just, alchemy. it makes you look at things different. So this is a, it is a marketing thing. Everything's a marketing thing for the most part. So we are not marketing to our youth or educating however you want to look at that that actually health is capital, right? We know that money is important, right? We know that that actual, mm. you know, financial capital is important. We know that social capital is somewhat important, right? Nobody wants to be ostracized, kicked out of the tribe. That's why public speaking is one of the top fears is we just, it, it's like public death, right? To have this social outcast. Oh, I, we talked about the kind of like, you know, uh, accepting of obesity is, you know, well, if you're happy, we're happy. Maybe we need to remarket this thing that like health is capital and that if you lose that, and this is kind of the way that healthcare is going to drive this thing, right? Capitalism, I think is going to save healthcare and I'll explain that here in a sec, but we need to market to kids at a young age that like, if you lose this stuff, like you won't be able to do X, Y, Z, right? If you end up on mm -hmm. the four medications by the age of 40, the amount of money to keep up with that would look like this. Like we just don't teach anybody this stuff. So again, you, if you don't have the information, mm -hmm. you're operating from ignorance, not idiocy. If you got the info, then you're an idiot. And that's the definition, not me being mean. Um, yeah. Can I pause you on the, yeah. the health and capital? Yeah. It's, so my, my dad, I remember this conversation vividly. When I was 16 years old, my dad sat me down and taught me about opening a fidelity account and compound interest and if you save this money this much per month and even though it's not much right now it's going to turn into a much bigger investment down the line that will be capital that will be an asset to you and i went and did my own research and looked at all these graphs and how much 
money you have to put in and over what period of time and how much that will grow different stocks and stuff like that and that excited me that excited the hell out of me because who doesn't want to be wealthy that's you can do more things it's more freedom and i feel like if if there was something equivalent to that that i was shown at the time and and i was lucky i i I was playing baseball i had an interest in fitness i i naturally leaned towards someone who liked exploring movement and fitness so I didn't really need to be convinced as much than someone who wasn't interested. But it, let's say I wasn't interested in health and fitness at all. If I was shown a graph with concrete numbers of if I put this much investment into my body, this exercise, this period of time, and then I continue to do that over the course of my life, this is what I'll be able to do. This is what I'll have from a health capital standpoint. And this is where I'll be if I don't do that. Like the opposite side of the line. These, this is all the shit that I mm -hmm. that I won't be able to do. And actually, I think you're absolutely right. L framing things in terms of having an asset and your health is an asset, but it's hard to communicate that because mm -hmm. I can have a thousand dollars in my bank account and then take five hundred of that and then go buy something and then I have this concrete thing. But but it's you have your health. I have the ability to do certain activities and perform certain uh, feats of, of strength or mobility where, wherever you're currently at. But a lot of those things aren't as concrete. So I feel like if we were able to translate that into similar type of similar types of graphs that people look at when they're looking at wealth and and capital and compound interest that that would grab a, a 13 year old kid and be like holy shit you know i want to be wealthy in money but also be wealthy in, in fitness and health and being able to use my money and health together to live this fucking badass life well let me explain the capitalist savior of health uh type thing so with most anything that happens, like the worst things that happen to us in our personal lives or, you know, societal lives are actually the biggest catalyst for, you know, improvement or change. And I think that's what COVID's going to be. The reason being is, as weird as it sounds, being unhealthy is becoming unpopular for the first time ever. Before we used to think of being unhealthy as like fate. Oh, you, you know, <laughs> for playing Oregon Trail, you got cholera, you got diphtheria, you're dead. Like, eh, you got a disease. Yeah. Now we're starting to understand like, well, if you're obese, it's like not just like you're big boned or it's genetics, like it's really your environment and lifestyle and a lot of choices. Okay. So now you're making a choice to be unhealthy, which then could lead to diseases that then cause you to die or other people to get sick that were around you, right? Which is a huge thing. So what I think is going to happen with anything, I think it will become in vogue to be healthy, right? That's kind of where you're seeing stuff heading. Like, why weren't we told that being healthy offset this? Well, how do you be healthy? Which then we'll get into this, you know, for a while, it'll swing wild over to the pendulum. People will market a bunch of shit to people that's not actually useful. But then it'll land back in the middle where people, I think, will kind of look at it and there'll be a negative and a positive of this of like, healthy is a good thing. Just like if you're, nobody wants to say this, if you don't have money, that's looked at as lower, right? Like, God, I do not want to be mm. poverty stricken. I do not want to be poor. <laughs> nobody would say, I want to be poor. <laughs> For the most part, I cannot imagine there's a whole lot of people that would just be like, yeah, yeah, sign me up for poverty. There are not a lot of people that in essence, if we asked them today would say, I want to be unhealthy. But once they learn how that uh, like actually occurs, that it's not just chance, you just mm. don't get a disease. <laughs> you do sometimes, but that's where for the first time ever, the blinders are coming off because we are wildly unhealthy, maybe for the first time on a mass scale um, as a human society realizing that like, oh, how I live my life every day makes it easier or harder to get sick and then how I recover from these things or injury. And then that's the capital, right? The investment is hitting yeah. these things resiliently and robustly. And once that starts getting marketed, now companies will spin stuff that way, right? Of, hey, become mm. more resilient, become more robust, become your best self so when you get sick or so you don't get sick, but that's what medicine has done for years. That's what that goes back to the opioid yeah. thing. That's all they've been marketing is that we'll prevent the disease. We'll get rid of that. Well, for the first time ever, now people are losing their trust massively. And, you know, the major 
allopathic model, and this is the capitalist piece, the market will determine the outcome, right? So if people start wanting to take care of themselves, they don't want to rely on a pill surgery, pay huge insurance premiums for shitty insurance coverage, pretty soon the market starts to demand stuff and that's where stuff changes. I mean, you know, I don't want to sound like socialist versus capitalism is the like the only play, but like that's how I think it's going to play out. Yeah. And when the market starts to change, people's view of what's cool will also change when people are spending money, time and energy on becoming healthy. You'll look at a fat guy driving a Bentley and think, yeah, he might have a lot of money, but he's actually pretty poor health wise. Just like if you looked at a guy that was living in a shitty apartment, can barely afford rent, but he's putting in what he can do health wise and he actually looks pretty good. Yeah, he might not have a lot of money, but he's wealthy from a health standpoint. He's wealthier in ways than the guy in the Bentley with his body and his mind, but the the guy in the Bentley is also wealthy with money, but he's poor in the the health aspect because he literally is missing an asset that the 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 guy with less money has acquired and vice well, versa. When you approach this from the evolutionary biology standpoint, this is where it really makes sense though, right? As little as, I would even say a hundred years ago, maybe a little further back, you were looked at as successful if you were overweight because it meant that you had enough means to have enough food for surplus, right? We, that's yeah, the, it's like that's the, the, the girls. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say the girls, it would, the girls, uh, you know, they seek out the fat Italian guy in the restaurant. It's like in the movies, you see that, that character, that mafioso fat character is the one with six, six beautiful women yeah. on his arm because that's, that's seen as the, the picture of health. Yeah, because or picture that of wealth, you, not health. Yeah. Well, that because that's seen as you don't have to do work or you have other people do work for you. You can you have enough money to bring in calories or enough means. Because we never had that, right? As a species. Most animals don't have surplus, right? Like that's mm -hmm. the whole thing. We're not dealing with frontal lobe decision making process. We're dealing with hind brain, deep seated. Dude, that still seems like a good thing to have extra, whether it's money, calories, stuff, whatever it is, we want more because that's how we're designed. And for the first time ever, like I say in the book, we're having to consciously fight back or beat back the evolutionary drivers that are actually putting us in this unhealthy spot. Evolution takes a long time. What we yeah. can start to do is smartly market to the hindbrain, which has the social norms and mores built into it that say, this is kind of what society thinks is normal. And then we see that intergenerational change occurs or epigenetics occurs. And over a couple of generations, you'll see evolutionary, you know, adaptation. That's what I think is going to happen. I hope, mm. or everybody's going to upload into the metaverse and say, fuck their bodies. And we'll, we'll just see the world end. I don't know. Yeah. But it could go either way. Yeah. That's the other option. <laughs> that's the, the metaverse option is coming into play more and more every day. But yeah, that's, uh, that's a good point and now i feel like it's it's flipping where the the socio the socioeconomic signals are flipping where people in poverty in western society are struggling more with obesity than they are malnutrition so obesity is no longer a sign of wealth and prosperity you you may look at obesity now as a sign of oh you actually don't have the means to take care of yourself. You may not be educated. You may not be given the the proper information you need to be able to have a wealth of health, not just a wealth of in money, but taking care of your body. So I feel like those signals are starting to flip a little bit just because obesity is becoming something that is more associated with poverty now than it's ever been. And we've always, you know, so that's kind of the, the, the strange thing. Like, where does that flip change where, you know, so in some societies being a little overweight or pudgy is actually still seen as attractive or ideal. So like, where's that flip change where it's not a, uh, because it's a societal norm thing that we think like obesity is like less than, right? Like that's still like our body's mm. still pushing us to eat more and all the, all of us, right? Like we're, that's why we're, our neurochemicals are being hacked by food companies. Like we know this is how we're built, but like, where's that flip? 
And that's, I mean, Jordan Peterson talks about this stuff a lot, right? Like to tap into, to get yourself to change is actually going like way further back in how you process stuff. And I think that goes into mm -hmm. our emotional responses, um, you know, and evolutionary biology or sociobiology, like EO Wilson kind of talks about, like, those are the things that marketing companies pay attention to, but we just need, like, they're going to start shifting what they're looking for. And hopefully it does have a positive spin because you could just take this stuff and sell people snake oil over and over again, which is what you see a lot of now just since COVID mm -hmm. some of the supplements and different routines. And I mean, breathing is one of those things, like some of the breathing routines that are sold out there, it just it's baffles me that people pay money for the stuff, but that's like the world we mm -hmm. live in. Right. Yeah. Going back to looking at obesity through the frame of movement, is there anything that you've seen about the movement of obese people or obese clients that has surprised you in some way, a, a movement pattern where maybe you didn't think obese people would be able to move in a certain way, but they are, it isn't affected that this a particular movement pattern isn't as affected by weight as you thought and anything like that. Oh yeah. I've had people that are, you know, multiple times, you know, uh, BMI obesity count, you know, multiple thresholds over that move far better than I do. Right. Nail it, feet together, deep squat, can do every movement, which is a lot of that's based on tissue laxity and, you know, genetic prevalence, but then they may have great body control too. I mean, just because you're overweight doesn't mean you move poor necessarily because a lot of that's due to motor mm -hmm. control and feedback. Like we talked about earlier, the thing is like, it's also that gets in, it's the same scenario as when do you change the movement on the athlete? Like how long can you move that well with, you know, extra compression across joint surfaces with the inflammatory component, which is probably the much bigger deal, right? David Seaman, another chiropractor mm -hmm. is famously quoted for saying like, you can't have arthritis without inflammation. It's not a wear down disease of joints. It's there's inflammation present. You wear down a joint with normal activity and then the inflammation like goes in mm -hmm. and does its work. Well, that's yeah. the component, right? Like you may get away with it for a long time, but like, you're not going to get away from it forever. So I've been really surprised, which it is surprising, but you got to think like NFL linemen, right? Some of the best athletes out there, honestly, especially for the size they are. Like think of a sumo wrestler. Like these are people that can move, move better in certain aspects, a lot better than I will ever move. So it's not just oh, the yeah. obesity, like it's the subset. It's like, uh, what toll is it taking? If it is taking a toll. In yeah. I've, I've had teammates that are overweight, weighed much more than me and, and it wasn't healthy weight that move a lot better than me and, and they're more athletic. And I've also seen overweight and obese people in the gym that move really well and and i'm like damn like you know this person is a fucking athlete they may be 80 pounds overweight but they're an athlete but the thing is you you don't see you don't see older faces as the face of a movement like fat positivity and, and at least not one not a face that i've seen it's always the younger man or woman who's overweight it's never the 40 50 60 year old person who's overweight still moving well and still being active so that's something that I, that I was thinking about too and in, in thinking about the the fat positive movement and preparing for this podcast is that it's yes you can live a fulfilling life very overweight in many aspects but your time is probably limited to how long you can keep that going. It's it's not a long term thing. Well, and a lot of that's herd mentality, right? As weird as it sounds, like how crazy is it that twenty six percent of the U.S. population is just normal weight? Only twenty six percent. So yeah. the other seventy four percent is trying to societally normalize being overweight. That's the whole thing, right? They're just like we want to mm -hmm. be accepted. So it's kind of funny that it is trying to be accepted when it actually should be accepted because it's the overwhelming majority of the population. So mm -hmm. again, the fact that it, there's even this little tip for Tad about what there is or not shows us that inherently it's not healthy because people know it's not or it still wouldn't be an issue. We'd be like, no, most people are overweight. Obviously you're yeah. weird if you're not overweight. That's not what's happening. Um, yeah. The other thing is, and this is where I will... I don't want to give a scapegoat, but like, if you wanted to talk about an environment that's harder than ever to be normal weight, it's now, right? Like 
the food that's in front of you, the choices, the xenoestrogens and all the phytochemicals and everything that's in all the crap that's around us. Like all of these things are literally disrupting our physiology to turn the lever's knob to worse health with one of those main things being weight gain. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm not giving people an out and you can have true hormonal disruptions and genetic issues that lead to weight gain or the inability to lose weight. But like it is harder than ever, but that's where you have to be like primed with knowledge and the knowledge that inspires action to get over this stuff. Um, cause it's only going to get harder, right? Like <laughs> yeah. and that sucks. So that's where like, maybe it's not even, I want to get people excited. Like we were talking about earlier, but like, you know, is it exciting to think about climate change and like how you would beat that? No, but is it necessary? Yeah. So like that, that's another marketing issue. Right. But that's a huge deal. Yeah. I don't know how you get people excited to save the planet besides saying like, you're going to die if you don't, but I, I don't know. Yeah. You know, that's a tough one. That's. Th- this is this is an argument I go back and forth with my girlfriend all the time is the desire to be climate conscious and where that comes from and who is responsible for that because she's more conscious about climate change and, and things like recycling and, and things that I regularly do but just I I don't care as much as her and I'm okay with that and she's okay with me being like that and I tell her, I say, okay, from a marketing standpoint and a podcasting standpoint, I'm constantly thinking on social media, how can I make this m- more engaging? How can I draw people into this content? I think it's the burden of the science communicators and the scientists to be science communicators and communicate with people that are posting on social media or post about it themselves and make me excited about doing things that are going to lead to act it's going to lead to a better outcome for our planet and there are people doing that there are people that are posting very interesting content about climate change and uh things like recycling and nuclear power and i've had some of those people on the podcast and it's very it's very interesting and it's very engaging and i i i agree with you i I don't think you can scare people into making changes you can with some things up to a certain point but you have Mm -hmm. to eventually you have to eventually ask yourself, how can I excite the average person about climate change or about moving better, becoming healthier, producing a podcast? It, the burden is on the person who wants the change to engage people and create engaging content. It's hard to make yourself interested in something that is not presented in an interesting fashion. Which is just kind of... a. Uh it's an interesting way to look at it because again, from a biological primer excitement, right? Like a lot of reasons that we do stuff is obviously neurochemically driven, right? Endorphins and all these things that we're seeking out. But at the end of the day, you would think that our survival mechanism kicks in at some point, but here's this kind of gets back to the Laird Hamilton thing. We're in such a scenario that we don't, we cannot, see the forest for the trees, right? From the climate issue, your how your health affects my health, how the things that you're doing right now will affect you in five years. We literally can't because that's not how we're programmed, right? That's why, you know, uh, Eckhart Tolle and all these people make all this money writing books on like the power of now. Like we're terrible at it. Yeah. Um, but I think that's the the bigger piece here is like why would things that are absolutely going to result in your either earlier or ultimate demise not be appealing Mm -hmm. to do like that's really interesting to me yeah i agree with you what we're pulled to more is the excitement but i think that's part of the societal issue though right we're all dopamine serotonin endorphin crazed based on how we live our lives so then the only thing that can pull us out is more of that so what i mean i mean we know that from like our cell phone usage what we seek to do um entertainment but like, I, I really think we're, we're fighting evolution. I mean, that's Dan Lieberman's whole mismatch hypothesis, right? That we're fighting evolution mm-hmm. for the first time ever because we have to. That is a very, that's uncharted territory. Like literally yeah. <laughs> no species ever had to do that or had the conscious ability to do that because they can't reconcile that. Um, so it's uncharted water. So nobody really knows what to do. So it may be we need excitation and, you know, um, 
to create some interest in it. We, I agree, scare tactics only work for a while and then they don't because people kind of shut off, right? That's kind of like the, um, I'm trying to think of the book, uh, basically where we just kind of cash our chips and we're like, yeah, it's, I, we're screwed, right? If you're going to just scare me this much, it's not worth it. Like I'm just done. Um, yeah. Recapture the Rapture by Jamie Wheel. Another book, it just talks about like, yeah, okay. you just be like, yeah, I'm done. Meteor's going to hit the planet. Why would it be healthy? So it's, it's a weird spot. To yeah. Be it, yeah, it, sh- I, it should be enough to want to make a change to have your uh having your survival threatened should be enough to make you want to change a habit or change your life but in a lot of cases it's it's not and i've been there where i know a habit is affecting an outcome in my life whether it's very small or i continue to do something like dipping in baseball Mm -hmm. i dipped like a fiend for two three years and i knew in the back of my mind that this has a breaking point. I'm going to get to a point where I'm almost certainly going to develop cancer. I'm just playing with that right now because I'm 18 years old and I don't feel like anything can happen. And I'm banking on being able to quit as soon as I stop playing baseball, which luckily I was able to do. But a lot of people move on to cigarettes or another form of nicotine. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 a, a crazy notion that death is not enough of a deterrent and we're we're seeing that with covid now where people can go look up the correlation between comorbidities and people who have gotten covid and obesity i believe is the highest or one of the highest comorbidities associated with people who are dying from covid and a lot of people still did not make the choice to lose weight it it would be interesting to see how covid affected people's desire to get in better shape or lose weight i don't i don't have numbers on that but i'm sure those studies will be coming out soon you know if not this year like how many people was covid enough of a deterrent to lose weight that okay i have this percentage chance of dying because i'm in this obesity category okay, who made the decision to then start running 20 minutes a day or doing something like that? So that'd be Mm -hmm. interesting. But it's wild that death in some cases is not enough of a deterrent to make us change. When there's there's some hypothesis out there that say that a lot of the reasons that we can't tap into the things that make sense, right? Like the survival mechanism or the fear of death is because of the amount of people on earth, right? Sebastian Younger talks about this, that we're Mm. beyond a tipping point where we don't feel we're part of a tribe. There's too many people. So it's kind of, I have to be by myself because like, I can't be part of anything because there's too much, right? We're not, we've never had this many people. Yes. Maybe we're on the capacity that's normalized. Um, but like kind of my thought process on that is like, if we learned a lesson from the past, like we go back to like world war two, like honestly, the human race was never facing shit that was that bad. Like even now, right? Like the threat of nuclear, like, all out nuclear war, all these things. But what do we actually see people do? That's when people like banded together big time, massive, you know, policy, societal changes. We also saw like the biggest economic boom. Um, this is when there was a lot of other factors here at play, right? That there weren't the detractors of like poor mm-hmm. nutrition. People were still relatively healthy going into this. So then you wonder, is health the precursor to shit falling apart? Um, but I think if we had to kind of start with the yeah. society level, I think we kind of start to figure out you know, social media has probably divided us more than it's brought us together. However, we want to think about that. And I think that's a bigger player is like, we don't feel like we're part of something. So again, it gets back to why would I want to be more healthy if it's just for me? Cause I'm going to live to be 80. Cool. Like, well, maybe Mm -hmm. if you live to be 80, far more healthy, you can help your family out in different ways. You're not as much of a financial burden on, you know, the rest of your tribe, your people, the community, the government, things like that. But nobody has the bandwidth to think about that because we're worried about, like you said, like, how do I make my thing more popular? How do I make myself more money? How do I make myself more healthy? Which are all fine. But if we could do those in a way that it actually extrapolated out to other people, right? Like the quote I call, you know, from Matthew McConaughey, like what's good for me is good for we, like that's the thought. But we've been led down this path Mm -hmm. of like, fuck it, I'm going to do whatever I want. So we're, we're selfish without yeah. the thought of how it affects everybody else. I'm just going to do whatever. I don't care. Yeah. I, 
I have a split view on social media and maybe I'm a little bit more optimistic on our future use of social media than you might be. But I, I see social media as a tool like money. You can use money however you want to do good, to do bad, to do nothing. You can just keep it. And we are at the helm of the companies that create social media because everyone wants to be on the platform that everyone else is on. And a long time ago, these companies made the decision that engagement is going to be the number one driver to what we're going to make decisions around. So whatever is going to keep someone on Instagram or on TikTok for the longest period of time is what we're going to optimize for. And I think, or hopefully, I don't, there's a lot of things working against this, but if there, there was a regime change in social media corporations or maybe a new model came along where you were optimizing for human flourishing over engagement, maybe keeping someone on social media for 45 minutes or three and a half hours is not a good thing. And short term companies see that keeping you on social media for three and a half hours is going to make you much more money than 45 minutes per day. But if there was a shift with long term thinking of, no, we we can actually make more money off of these people and make more money with each other where the people are the product, but also we're allowing people to productize themselves in better ways because they're not being sucked into social media. There's less depression. There's less anxiety. Both sides are winning. That's a very idealistic look at the world and social media. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but I, I do think there's more opportunity and more money and more fulfillment to be made if the corporations like Instagram uh, and TikTok and you know Twitter, if they stopped optimizing as harshly as they do for engagement and took a step back and thought about, okay, what if we optimized for these other, what, what if we optimized for changes in mental health or I don't know, uh, you know, posting how people react when things are posted in a more positive manner, or maybe people will spend just as much money on social media being on it for half the time. Maybe that isn't as directly correlated as we think, but to kind of just get away from this engagement model is my rant against social media. Cause I, I use it as a tool for podcasting. It's how people will find about this, find out about this podcast. If you're watching this podcast right now, maybe you saw a reel on Instagram or Facebook and you chose to listen to this podcast, which I hope is the case. But then it's also, I feel myself getting sucked into it. And so I'm, I, I go back and forth with it all the time. When I, I probably have a very different view of social media. Um, and this kind of goes way down the rabbit hole, but Social media right now, yeah, is a it's a for money for profit business, right? Like, but the profit is coming from advertising dollars, right? The disillusionment in traditional advertising is going way down. I mean, just terrible. So I also think capitalism will change what social media is because people, I mean, they'll start deleting ads. Like, it'll just change. It's going to right, and they'll figure out a new way to make money. My thing is when you I pose this question in the book. I don't know if you remember this that I say, have you ever thought what language does a baby speak in before they actually can understand language? Mm. Like, how are they formulating thoughts in their head? Which yeah. Is like one of those questions, like, holy shit, or at least I mm -hmm. did. Well, what we found out yeah. was it's, ab it's abstractions, it's patterns, it's actually higher level things that can't be communicated with human speech patterns, right? So we actually have to dumb down our thought processes for speech. So it's the first time we dumb down things, which is crazy. Because you would think from mm -hmm. an evolutionary standpoint, that's not how it would work. Here's my thought. Um, I've heard other people talk about this a little bit, like how emojis were this, like, you know, the first use of like going back to, you know, ancient language and shit. I'm not down that rabbit hole. What I think is going to happen is if there were open source social media avenues, you would see that it would change communication, right? There's a reason mm -hmm. that things hit on TikTok that are absolutely asinine, right? That it's mm -hmm. random cuts of stuff. Because literally what's happening is what? You're yeah. getting to see how a person thinks in a very abstract way. That's what mm -hmm. humans are about. That's why 
music is looked at at a higher order process of communication than speech because you have to put rhythm and timing and all these things together to make music versus I can tell you the same thing. If I sing it, you actually think it has more value. Mm -hmm. So this is where, and we give, you know, that book sitting on your desk, maybe not nowadays in the self-publishing area, but if you could write a book that gave you a lot of social capital because you could put thoughts Mm -hmm. to paper, which concreted an abstractionism. So here's my thought. It'll change the way we communicate if we let it. But if it's led by money, nobody will let that happen because you can't right now. And I'm not smart enough, I guess, to think of how you would capitalize financially on that model. But once we do that, then I think it is a thing for massive good because you're going to see that it helps us problem solve way different and communicate way different than we ever did, which is Mm -hmm. kind of where it was headed. And then a lot of stuff started happening. Yeah. To bring things full circle, we started talking with movement and I wanted to, in the last 10 minutes or so, get into DNS. And I wanted to ask you, could you give people a brief overview of what DNS is and why you chose to focus on it to make it one of your most popular playlists on YouTube? I mean, mean, you made the videos and then it became one of your most popular playlists on YouTube where these 90 second to two and a half minute videos are getting, you know, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 views. And there's a reason for it. What is DNS and how can DNS be used to improve the way that we move? Uh, so DNS, I mentioned him earlier, but Pavel Kolaj is a, um, he's actually a physiotherapist and a neurologist out of the Czech Republic that works out of the Motol hospital there. But he was an understudy of all of the giants in the, honestly, the physical therapy realm, right? Chiropractic was not a thing, um, in Eastern Europe at this time, but like Vladimir Yanda and, uh, oh gosh, I'm blanking on a few of the other big names, but. Um, they'll come to me here in a second. These were the uh, Vladimir Voita, uh, Carol Levitt. These were the like mm-hmm. behemoths of like this realm. Well, he studied with them. Like was there, they were his mentors directly. So here you take this person again, amazing athlete, gets these mentors, starts to think about these things, which were the concepts are already built, right? There's nothing new with humans. It's just how we perceptualize it and then package it to make it make sense to other people. So he started putting together the concepts really from Voita, which was doing what's called reflex locomotion because he worked with uh, people that really had like neuromotor developmental issues, right? Like cerebral palsy. Um, Mm -hmm. And he started working with these people. And then the way he was working with people, Pavel Kolosh said, well, wait a minute, maybe this goes outside of people with neurodevelopmental disorders. So maybe it's normal public, maybe it's babies, maybe it's athletes. So DNS is less of a methodology and way more of a lens. Right. So it, it mm-hmm. adheres to the principles of what's called developmental kinesiology, which is just how we learn to move without being taught how to move on a normal timeline. So, right. Humans are one of the mm-hmm. few mammals that come out of the womb that aren't fully developed movement wise. So it takes us a long time. It's because mm-hmm. the theory is that we have a massive central processor, a brain that can do a lot of cool stuff. Well, that takes time to develop. So we sacrifice early movement. We link our central nervous system development to movement. So as we mature, we're building parts of our brain and the way we move is actually a representation of our central nervous system maturation or development, Mm. which that's the whole theme. Well, how do we use it for exercise and treatment, things like that? Well, it doesn't matter what you're working on, right? How you move is largely dictated by these subcortical patterns that were set early in life. And then what you do over time. So if you miss a step, right? If I don't crawl, if my parents set me up in some weird chair before I can actually sit upright, if I have a nervous system disorder, right? Or I have a stroke Mm. or all these things, it affects like how my body moves. Well, I'm going to go back to square one. That's what DNS is doing. We're saying, hey, this is kind of an idealized pattern, right? Idealized, not dogmatic, just idealized. We want people to go back into these movements that were pre-programmed utilize that to tap into pure movement, centration of joints, good muscle synergy around joint complexes. And with that, we can do a lot of cool shit, like, you know, increase range of motion, get people out of pain, decrease muscle tension. Um, I mean, all sorts of stuff. And then the, the far end of the spectrum is you're really working on how you process stuff within your cerebellum and then also your cortex. 
that's where you mm. see crazy stuff happen. Like one quick example is I had a, I think at the time he was a six-year-old kid that he never crawled. Um, and then he didn't walk until he was almost two, which for people that don't know, you should walk around 12 to 15, 16 months. He never mm -hmm. walked until two until he started going to PT to walk. Well, he gets to about six years old. He can't touch his toes. Sitting in the bathtub, his parents say he's complaining of like hamstring tightness, having pain. He comes in and we work like two sessions. <clears throat> Kids are like little sponges. So he, you know, stuff changes mm -hmm. fast using DNS. Well, his mom comes back in like the third visit and she goes, you know, he's doing really well. He can touch his toes now and all this stuff. Like we're talking like two weeks. But she goes, the interesting thing is his teacher said that like his writing is like vastly improved, right? His fine motor like control was really? like through the roof because he had better ability to process stuff because that's what you're really working on, mm. right? We're not working on muscles and joints. We're working on your central nervous system, um, which is why mm. some people push back against us saying that because they're like, you don't understand neurology. Nobody does, not even the best neurologist in the world. And it's like, we've got a pretty good hunch and I'm going to operate off that good hunch rather than stretching and icing and uh, foam rolling you to death. So that's what I'm going to go with. Yeah, that's, I mean, I've, I've never really thought about being able to process things better and think better and do things like writing better because I've, I've, moving better with my body or, or somehow reprogram myself to, to move better. And then that leads to more motor function and, and maybe, you know, just the flow from thinking something to actually doing something like writing. But it makes sense because I, I've, you know, I've lived so much of my baseball career in a constant state of being tight and then trying to get loose and then not feeling like I'm moving better and then trying to move better and then something else comes up. And when you aren't moving well and you feel like your hamstrings are tightening up in a bathtub like this kid, you're just sitting there and you can't even sit in peace feeling relaxing and like your body mm -hmm. can and just sit there. Um, the, the peak of that for me was I went into a float tank this last, this past weekend for the first time and just feeling the, the looseness of my body and sitting there and my thoughts becoming clearer and, and connecting things and just being like, wow, this is, this is what I thought I wanted and I don't want this or I do want this. And now I'm thinking about shit that I, uh, probably shouldn't be thinking about because i'm in a fucking float tank and just enjoy <laughs> life um but it, but it does make sense that movement would be tied to thought patterns and and processing and you know maybe maybe there's even a spiritual element to it that we can't pick up or perceive but i've i've had a sense that you know movement is a way to live better for a long time and was very stubborn in the past to put movement on the back burner for other things and now that I've had something like baseball removed for my life where I'm just like moving to move I'm not moving to throw harder I'm not moving to be able to lift past a certain amount to compete in some way just moving to move it's it's fascinating to connect some of the things that I've never thought would be correlated to movement or, or have to do with movement. When they're, you know, I always tell people, this is kind of the way I approach treatment and the way I look at things is I'm trying to remove the body as a variable, right? Like you said, like for me, I'm a relatively tight person. So if you tell me to sit like in full Lotus and sit there and meditate, I'm not able to meditate well, because why I'm thinking about how damn tight my hips are. So then mm -hmm. I got to sit on a yoga block to offload my hip to get into a good position to mm -hmm. be like, okay, now I can actually like, that's the first time I thought about that was like, oh, my back's slightly uncomfortable in this position. Well, like you said, what if you're uncomfortable all day long, your frontal cortex is literally focused on that pain, right? And then you can't process, you do that for years. Like, yeah, you're switching a bunch of neurochemicals and thought processes. I mean, and that's, you know, yoga for thousands of years, it was, it's not a, body physical practice that's a mental practice right that's the reason mm -hmm. they're doing is it to clear especially um like kundalini yoga that's a clearing of the body to mm -hmm. get the mind to work better like that's purely what it is 
Um, so like you look at that stuff and you're like, okay, like your body is a conduit to allow your nervous system to operate appropriately, whether that's you doing something with your body or vice versa, right? If there's something going on, that's going to be expressed. And I mean, some of the better examples of that are, um, like if you, so graphesthesia, right? So if I draw letters on your back, if I do something in an area of your body, so say you have a stiff ankle and I get your ankle moving mm-hmm. better, your ability to tell what letters I'm writing on your back goes up. It's just your body's wow. a system of systems and the feedback of your ankle is now optimized. So your brain's like, well, I don't have to deal with that as much, right? I can like quiet that mm-hmm. down because I know what's going on. Now I can up the ante. Well, why do we think good athletes have great feedback? They probably move a little bit better than us in general. They got better neuromotor control and then they can coordinate all these things and really mm-hmm. well put together, you know, synapses through the cerebellum and cerebrum. So, yeah. So if, if you, if, if you're listening to this and you go to the farm YouTube channel for the first time and you're interested in DNS, is there a group of movements or specific movements that you recommend people start with? Does it have to be in the order from months where you have it separated zero to three months or three to six months? How would you suggest someone start in DNS? God, I guess I should do this. This is the number one question I've got on YouTube is, can you put these videos in order of a developmental sequence? And the reason I don't is the other question I get is, what exercises do I do for this thing, for my ankle sprain, for this? And I'm like, Mm -hmm. but that's not how humans work, right? Because I don't know what your thing is. So we never, just because of time, we're never going from three months to two years in the office, right? Developmental sequence, like that's just not plausible Mm -hmm. and that's not efficient. The reason we wouldn't do that also is you have different sticking points than I do. So that's a tough thing. What I would say is conceptually what people need to work on is, which is part of DNS is intra-abdominal pressure, starting in lower positions, like three months supine. If you've heard of a dead bug, that's the same thing. You're on your back, legs and arms up. That's where a baby starts, right? It's either there or on their stomach, just Mm -hmm. barely lifted up. If you can do some intra-abdominal pressure, some belly breathing in those positions, and do it for a period of time so there's some endurance that's a great starting point then that concept right the ability to breathe create pressure maintain a position um goes across the spectrum all the way up to you know squatting heavy weight running Mm -hmm. sprinting hitting a baseball that's where dns Mm -hmm. became so ubiquitous across the sports field is because people like oh it's a concept driven idea or a concept you know, methodology rather than like, this is how you do this stuff. And that's why I like it so much. Do you feel like you've entered a higher spiritual plane by moving better? Like this is something I was thinking about before the podcast is movement is tied to so many things that we do in life. And as we end off, I I wanted to ask you about the way that you felt connected to fellow human beings that you have a relationship with, strangers, anyone, when you move better, do you feel like you're in a higher level of connectedness to the world around you? And maybe that movement is raising other people as woo woo as that sounds like, is there any, is there anything spiritual that you feel lifts inside you when you are unlocking movements? I definitely think it's a catalyst, right? Like I think it's the times that you're the most spiritual are when things are the worst, right? Which is kind of bad. Like, and I say the most spiritual is like where you're going to like cling to that. The other times Mm -hmm. are when stuff is like ostentatious, right? You're just like, holy shit, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the spectrums. So I think, as I said, removing your body as a variable allows you to, yeah, answer one question, be more connected to the world around you because you don't have those hurdles, the variables, interference, whatever you want to call it. But as far as like the spiritual aspect, like we know that we're social beings, right? Like everything gets better, right? From a science standpoint with other people, exercise, eating, uh, sex, everything's better with other people. So if you move better individually and then you can move well with others which is kind of what we're designed to do right whether that's helping people do stuff act you know participating in sports have fun i literally think that's part of like uh 
and however you want to think about this, right? If you think it's a neurochemical cascade that leads to like a spiritual experience, or if it's truly a spiritual experience, I think your body is a big pathway for that. That's why I think so many people are seeking psychedelic experiences, right? They get mm-hmm. a rush of things that whether it's real, I don't want to say real, spiritual or chemically driven, I don't know, but that's why they're mm-hmm. doing it, right? It's for that connection, for mm-hmm. that like download. And I think you can get a lot of that. I mean, we've been showing that, right? Like you can do yoga, you can do breathing, you can do certain things and literally enter those psychedelic states. And then mm-hmm. you want to say like, okay, what was that? I don't know. I'm not here to explain that, yeah. but a hundred percent. And I would say the worse you move, the worse you feel, which is a backwards catalyst or aggression away from like your higher self. And if that's what we want to call a spiritual experience, right? Self-actualized, like higher Mm -hmm. self. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a no brainer that you're moving away from that version of yourself. Well, thank you, Dr. Bo Beard for your time. You've been extremely generous with your time today. So thank you again for taking, um, make making the the appearance on the podcast it's it's been an absolute blast and i know people will take away a lot of value from what you've said yeah i'm it's a great conversation um i love uh long format stuff like this because it doesn't happen enough and it's also you just kind of get to explore some different concepts and hear what other people think about them so i appreciate having me on man can, before we go, can you plug anything that you want people to pay attention to, whether it's it's the the book I have right here, The Age of Movement, YouTube channel, Instagram? Yeah. Um, so my personal website is just Bo Beards. That's B-E-A-U-B-E-A-R-D.com. Uh, like you said, the book uh, is on Amazon. It's on my website, the farm's website, and the Audible version should be dropping any day now. Um, just got to get that cleared. And besides that, yeah, just uh, social media at Dr. Bo Beard. That's everywhere. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Awesome. And all that will be linked in the podcast again, wherever you guys are listening or watching this so you can go check it out. And, uh, thank you again. This was uh, a really good time. Anytime, man. Appreciate it. Hey guys, this is a quick reminder to check out Auxoro Premium, the best deal in premium podcasting. On Auxoro Premium, you gain access to bonus episodes, the unlicensed therapy series, the ability to submit topic suggestions for the podcast, exclusive Ask Me Anything episodes, and the entire premium catalog for only five bucks per month. Go to auxoro.supercast.com, that's A-U-X-O-R-O.supercast.com to join the premium gang today.